Dragon Ball GT showcases some of the most powerful characters in anime history. In Dragon Ball GT's case, the community has endured an endless darkness of false and incomplete information about the series and its level of power. However, if you pay far more attention to detail, GT is more than meets the eye. If you're ready for this hell shaking analysis, give the video a like now, I appreciate it very much. So this is the first episode, I'm going to lay the foundation down of GT Goku's actual power at the start of GT before the adventure even begins, and I promise you, it's scary. So let's unlearn what we think we've learned about GT and start from the very beginning. Strap yourselves in for this grand tour of GT's broken potential. The GT universe follows the same model as Z's, and yes, the guides apply to GT because GT happened after Z and happened after the Daisenshu. It's been referred to throughout the anime of GT that there are four main galaxies, North, South, East and West. In Dragon Ball GT, the term Boundless Galaxies is referenced despite it only mentioning four main galaxies as well. So how does this work if in the Daisenshu 4, page 72, it describes the universe as the endless expansive space? Well, the Z universe is also backed up to be infinite where it states the Kai's supervise the galaxies that exist infinitely in all the universe. Interestingly, in the Daisenshu, it refers to East, West, South and North as sections, and in the Funimation dub, they refer to them as quadrants. But in the GT anime, it's mainly galaxies. Understanding the Dragon Ball universe can be very confusing and also contradictive with the information, but even Toriyama has stated he created the original diagram to help get our head around infinity, and there has been inconsistencies along the way that he has admitted. But however you view it, the most important information we need to know is that the Dragon Ball Z and GT universe are the same. GT is a side story sequel to Z's universe, and there are at least four galaxies in an endless space, where universal feat potential still applies in GT. Feat potential is not devalued, though in GT it references boundless galaxies, and perhaps this means the North, South, East and West are the four main galaxies, but the universe itself contains even more in its infinite space, just to balance out the main source material. But whichever way you want to view it, the source material is there to support this view. All of the calculations scale from Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu in the Z anime. It doesn't rely on Kid Buu being the strongest Buu. Goku vs Kid Buu is just a landmark that I use to progress from. The reason why it still stands strong that Kid Buu is the strongest Buu in the Z anime, and why I'll clearly refer to Kid Buu as the strongest in the Z anime in this video, is because Takeo Kayama not only contradicts it once, but twice. First, rectifying that he was talking about only the transformation boos. Kid Boo is not a transformation, it's his pure state. Secondly, and the biggest one, he follows up later with what he really wants to say. That the small boo is the strongest. The small boo? What, the millions of mini boos that reformed against Super Saiyan 3 Goku? Or does he mean... Kid Boo. Of course he does. This is the Z anime after all. So if you can take his previous Buhan tweet as golden, then I'm taking this one, the latest one, as golden because it's fair, right? And you will only disregard this one when it suits your viewpoint. So at the very least, it cancels his Buhan tweet out in the interest of fairness. After all you did was cling to his Buan statement, like it's gold dust. This is an official writer for Dragon Ball, it must be the truth. Well, what about the small Boo now? Now it's not, when it's convenient for you? What makes me laugh here is that the dialogue here from the Z anime was authorized and Koyama was the guy in charge. Think about it, kid. Not just any screenwriter, but the god Damn chief screenwriter! Z anime was written by Kayama. This dialogue is writing. Takeo writes. Think about it, kid. Writing. Screenwriter. Dialogue. Writing. Hey, <laughs> Clearly, Toriyama rang him up and told him to sort that shit out online. ASAP. Either way you want to cut the cake, it makes no difference to this. Turn the other way, honey. During the end of Z Tournament, Goku does battle with Oob. 
Oob is the reincarnation of Kid Buu and Goku heavily implies he will be fighting against a guy as strong as Kid Buu and that they may not even win the tournament at all. And after the fight, he admits to Oob that he's exactly the person he thought he was, as amazing as he expected, to which he expected Oob to be relevant to the amazing power of Kid Buu. However, Oob at this time was untrained, so even if he wasn't harnessing the full power that Kid Buu had, he was tapping on the door to it in their fight. Vegeta even told Goku that both of them, including Oob, couldn't go serious at that tournament, prioritizing Oob's name over Mr. Boo who was there. And this works because Kid Boo was greater than Fat Boo. And this also strengthens the fact that Oob is relevant in terms of Kid Boo's power, or at least in terms of raw power, where all he needs to do is train and learn how to use it. Goku fought Oob in base form and matched that power. This would make base Goku relevant to his Super Saiyan 3 self that fought Kid Buu, making base Goku gain an approximate 400 times power increase over 10 years. There are a lot of downplays when it comes to Buhan's feet. Buhan's Universal Plus feet still stands in the Z anime, and the feet is 100% a Universal Plus feet. It's about significantly affecting the space time of a universe. Buhan's feet is not merely a domino effect. It's not merely a few dimensions opening. A universe by definition is a 4D space-time continuum. The Daisenshu states that Buhan was about to wipe out the universe and that Super Buu had used a similar, albeit weaker, power in the room of spirit and time, another dimension. The time chamber has its own space-time continuum, meaning he can move across space and time. And if that same power allows him to travel via distortions, it would have to be distorted in space and time to do so since it allowed him to travel between two different space times. Buhan 100% affects the space time of the universe as his power was a far greater version of what Super Buu did. Vegito even says the universe will be crushed by alternate dimensions. Think about it, every dimension has its own space and time and Buhan is combining them to crush another. Even Dende said at this rate the walls between dimensions will break down. Look at it this way, let's say a house is the universe. If I destroyed all the contents in the house and also destroyed the supporting beams and foundations of the house to make the entire building crumble down into destruction, am I building level? Yes I am. I got the job done. Buhan's way is just unorthodox and Buhan is building level confirmed. But I hope this helped clear that feat up. It significantly affects the space time of the universe and is universal plus. Five years pass after the end of Z and we have base Goku fighting Oob where both are equal. Oob had grown considerably stronger since End of Z going into the start of GT, and this means that Goku did too. We do know that a Goku with tons of free time, non-stop training in 10 years, can grow 400 times stronger, as he did from the Boo fight to End of Z. Can we apply half of that to 5 years of non-stop training too, giving him a 200 times increase? That may be the most reliable number in terms of his power growth. If base Goku at the start of GT is 200 times the Universal Plus feat already demonstrated, his Super Saiyan 1 transformation multiplies that power by 50, making him 10,000 times that Universal Plus level, and immediately makes Super Saiyan 1 GT Goku multiversal at the start of GT. Furthermore, his Super Saiyan 3 form would be 80,000 times that Universal Plus feat, where Goku would still remain a multiversal level fighter. So now we take lift off, heading off into the universe on the Grand Tour to explore what other characters in the Black Star Saga are as strong as this insane start in base power of Goku because the Black Star Saga is often skipped, ignored or forgotten about because the first 15 episodes or so before General Rildo showed up were GT's weakest episodes so I'm going to do you a service and bring to light just who gave Goku a run for his money and even defeated him at times. The entire Black Star journey takes a year so time is passing between each event which means Goku who will get stronger. So let's start off with one of GT's coolest and most underrated characters, Legic. Legic has an honorable personality and respects Goku. And he totally inspired Hit. 
He is able to deflect Goku's Kamehameha. He is able to cleanly knock base trunks to the ground. It's only when Goku turns Super Saiyan that he beats Legic without difficulty. Now, from what we saw with base Goku versus Legic, we do not know who the victor would have been without Super Saiyan. Based on Goku's face slightly struggling when holding Legic's swords, but Legic's face showing great attention and struggle, I would be inclined to think base Goku would have still beat him in terms of raw strength. But Legic did show some great attacking moves to hit Goku around with a great technical assault. Either way you want to cut the cake, we know Legic is not over 200 times Universal Plus in terms of his raw power, or 200 times beyond Kid Buu, but he doesn't fall short from it. Quite an impressive character, this is a level of power that could one-shot Kid Buu and Super Saiyan 3 Goku from the Buu Saga, and base Goku at the end of Z. Think about that, these guys are insanely strong, and this is only early GT, so after the Legic fight, Goku does state he is going to continue training, which is supplementary proof to his further growth in the saga. Let's move on to Cardinal Muchi Muchi, or should I just say Muchi, the Whip, one of the sub-bosses in the Lord Lude arc. This is actually another character that gets massively ignored. A great design too, and the first villain in GT to officially beat Goku, and not Goku in base, he beat Goku as a Super Saiyan. This guy, without a shadow of a doubt, was about to kill Goku time and drain his life force until Super Saiyan Trunks killed a defenseless Muchi from behind with a surprise attack. This guy has the ability to manipulate any objects that he touches. It all falls under his control. What an incredible feat. A fantastic support character for a tournament of power. To think that this character defeated a power of 10,000 times that of Universal Plus. 10,000 Kid Boos. It's insane. So it's safe to assume Muchi at least matches Super Saiyan Goku's power here in GT, thus making him Multiversal 2. We cannot assume Trunks' power yet, as it's common knowledge fighters typically off guard can get destroyed by most levels of power. But with Super Saiyan Goku and Super Saiyan Trunks teaming together, they do appear relative to each other. It's quite hard to tell the difference at this point. Next up, we have the Machine Mutant Lord Lude, God of Destruction, the final boss of the multiple episode story. As we know, Lude gains power by absorbing it from others. He managed to hit his level 2 stage and despite his inexperienced fighting, is able to tank base Goku's Kamehameha without flinching. The narrator also mentions Lude level 2 is inferior to Super Saiyan Goku and Trunks, so level 2 Lord Lude, in terms of raw power, is in between 200 times and 10,000 times Universal Plus. It's when Lude becomes level 3 after absorbing Pan that things get intense, being too much for Super Saiyan Goku and Trunks together. Lude is defeated by the team finding a weak spot in his design. Despite Muchi stating Lude will destroy the chaotic universe, and this is usually taken metaphorically, it could easily be believable as a feat statement if you wanted it to, based on his power that he's showcasing against Super Saiyan Goku and Trunks, which is far above 10,000 times universal, putting him in the multiversal range. All we need to know is Lude is above Super Saiyan Goku. However, months pass and the Rildo arc begins, and Goku encounters the Sigma Force on Planet M2 and states he's never faced a power as awesome as theirs for a while. This means the Sigma Force are comparable to Lord Lude, who Goku had fought up until that point. It took Super Saiyan Goku and Super Saiyan Trunks to barely fend off Lude. Now this new threat, the Sigma Force, is taken on by Goku alone, in base. And this would heavily imply that Goku at minimum got at least 50 times stronger in his base form in order to take on the Sigma Force, who are comparable to Lord Lude, that crushed Super Saiyan Goku months back. This makes base Goku in the Rildo arc at least 10,000 times stronger than Universal Plus. Still, don't mess with the Sigma Force, what an incredible power. Now we get onto the grand finale of the Black Star Saga, the final boss and one of the most criminally underrated characters in Dragon Ball history, General Rildo. There is a line that Goku states before fighting Rildo, admitting Rildo's power is even greater than Boo's, and the purpose of this statement is to solidify that the villains now at this point in GT are way past the days of Z. Rildo is the first main big boss and the strongest so far. So, it's even greater than Boo's should be seen as everyone now is leagues above those days. There have been arguments which Boo Goku is referring to, but it's not even that important due to how much Goku has grown already since Z. It's a no-brainer that Rildo is above early GT. But for fun, let's dissect which Boo it really is. It's quite simple. It's not Fat Boo, because why would Goku compare Rildo's power to a friend? And why would Goku use Fat Boo as a benchmark when there are fighters like Oob, Gohan, Vegeta who scale far higher than Fat Boo, 
plus Fat Boo was weaker than Kid Boo, and Goku right now is mountains above Kid Boo. Secondly, it's not Buhan. Because we have discussed in episode 1, GT is a continuation of the Z anime and incorporates the movieverse where in the Z anime, Kid Buu is stated to be the strongest Buu multiple times through narration and plot convenience, despite it making no sense. Therefore, Kid Buu was also the final boss of Z and stated to be the strongest Buu in the anime. It makes logical sense that Goku is referring to Kid Buu when stated in Rildo is even greater than that. But that should be no surprise right now, because of how strong GT Goku has become since the beginning of Z. All we need to know is Roldo and Base Goku are far above the likes of Kid Buu at this stage in the game. This statement solidifies that, that they've come a long way since Z. There is a statement in the GT Perfect Files that says Lude is the strongest machine mutant, but actual anime statements prove otherwise. Watching and reading the dialogue from the actual anime is more reliable than a guidebook because that's what actually happens. Rildo has some impressive feats. He is able to become the Planet M2 and controls all of the metal on it. Where else have we seen someone become the planet in recent Dragon Ball? It's a pretty incredible feat. Rildo can also transform twice, firstly by absorbing the Sigma Force, becoming Hyper Meta Rildo, and then finally his final form is Metal Form Meta Rildo. Whilst in his final form, he was stronger than Super Saiyan Goku, at one point forcing Goku to utilize Super Saiyan 2 to fight back. The insane multiplier of power in this fight between Goku and Rildo skyrockets their multiversal power. Now, with Super Saiyan multiplying Goku's power by 50, this would make Goku 500,000 times stronger than his Super Saiyan 3 self during the Kid Buu fight. Meta Rildo could be considered at least this level of power too for being able to deal with Goku successfully, but could also be nearly double that due to Goku at one point needing Super Saiyan 2 in order to fight back, so Meta Rildo for somewhere in between that range. There's one character I'm going to give an honorable mention to right now that feels more of a champion, just to prove that everyone has been wrong about her their whole life. So bring in Pan, and I don't care about anyone's feelings when it comes to Pan annoying them whilst watching GT, because the real shock is how strong she really is. Need I remind you this is Gohan's daughter, so in her blood, the blood of Ultimate Gohan, she has potential to be a powerhouse. At a very young age, she competed in the 28th Budokai Tenkaichi and destroyed Goten. This was a Goten that we saw training with Goku during End of Z, a Goten that turned Super Saiyan at a young age and had insane potential. Pan, a few years old, kicked his ass. And that's not even the best part. She did it in base. But serious, that's not the best part. Pan throughout GT showcases some hidden potential. But the main clue we get this is when she's in doll form and about to be absorbed by Lord Lude. It's stated the Pan doll holds incredible dormant potential, already hinting at her power. Next, Lude absorbs her, with her power being one third of Lude's helping him reach level 3, which then overpowered Super Saiyan Goku and Super Saiyan Trunks. Take that how you want, but that's not even the best part. When General Rildo shows up and Goku hyped that big boss up to be something special, Rildo stands there ready for war, and Pan charges towards him, punches him in the face, and kicks him on his ass. Even Goku was shocked, and Trunks questioned if she was stronger than himself. You can argue that Rildo was off guard, but that's a poor argument because Rildo looked ready and saw her attack coming with a smile on his face from directly in front. If Pan was incredibly weak and anything less than the power Goku sensed, this wouldn't have affected Rildo. But when she smashed his face in, you could see the disbelief in his face. This could be considered one of those boosts of potential moments that Kid Gohan used to showcase because Pan was also angry here too. However, she tries to punch Rildo when he gets back up, but this time Rildo tanks it and hits her away, proving that he has now gotten serious. But wait, that's not even the best part. Later on, when Rildo is in his final form, Super Saiyan Goku is running for his life, and then Meta Rildo turns his attention to Pan. He attacks her head on, but Pan challenges Rildo there, dodges him, and kicks him in the back of his head. Some Ultra Instinct shit right there. This was absolutely no accident. Rildo had his sights locked on Pan, and Pan counterattacks successfully with sheer power 
power and speed and kicked Meta Rildo's ass for a moment. Even his face is gutted, which he then only lost to him due to Rildo's metal technique. So yes, Pan is absolutely incredible, where she sometimes appears as this damsel in distress, but when she's written into action at certain points, she absolutely packs a punch, and his short first moments of power was able to take down someone that is multiversal in the ranges of 10,000 times to 1 million times Kid Boo, Pan at least ranges in between Kid Buu's power and a serious base Rildo. Due to Goku's statement upon Rildo's arrival, quite incredible, Kid Buu could be soloed by Pan in base. And that's it for the Black Star Saga. So here we go, Baby. The first time we see Baby is when he takes on Goku, Trunks, and Pan. Baby is the ultimate machine mutant. He has already absorbed Lord Lu's power, thus already putting Baby at default at least 10,000 times Kid Buu, as that was Lord Lu's power. Dr. Mew had gathered power throughout the entire universe, so 10,000 Kid Buu is an extreme low ball here. What you must know about Baby is that he is a parasite. He takes host of the body he is in, but also takes the power of the vessel, completely absorbs it. They are theories about the baby boost in how much he gives and this has been very difficult to gauge in the past because the fighters are receiving different buffs once baby is taking control. The secret of baby's power boost in the vessel is that baby's power is an addition of collected power rather than a set multiplier. Therefore the buff becomes stronger the more bodies he takes over and absorbs their power. This is why he's a parasite. Baby is the one getting stronger, and by the time he gets to Vegeta, the buff is at its strongest. So let me show you just whose power Baby absorbed and added it to his own, because you will be surprised just how strong this character really is. Upon Baby's surface, Baby isn't able to take on the combination of Goku, Trunks, and Pan. Base Goku is at the 10,000 mark, so if Baby is approximately the same, he would be unsuccessful here due to the help of Trunks and Pan. Towards the end of the episode, Baby is seen bursting out of Rildo after taking the General's power. It was also confirmed that Rildo's power had become Baby's along with Lude's. Rildo's maximum power as Metal Rildo was at least on par with Super Saiyan Goku, thus adding that to Lude's power, making Baby at least 510,000 times stronger than Kid Buu by the time he arrives on the hospital planet. When he encounters Goku, Trunks, and Pan again, it seems as though base Goku could handle him at the beginning after they surprise attack Baby, but what really happened then was that Baby started getting serious and realized his power. He literally powered up and blasted the three onto the ground with ease. This proves that his power had grown immensely after acquiring Rildo's power, but he didn't have the experience on how to use it, except in drastic circumstances. <laughs> Baby takes over Trunks and realizes that it's nothing like he's felt before, and that it's the power he desires. This would imply that Trunks' power deep down is above Baby somewhat, putting Trunks at at least 510,000 at Super Saiyan 1. Baby wouldn't be sensing this as only Trunks' base power because he literally just whipped him down without taking over his body. Using this, we can estimate base Trunks to be close to base Goku. So at this time, Baby is combining his 510,000 with Trunks' base power of approximately 10,000, thus making Baby Trunks in base 520,000 times of Kid Buu. Trunks begins to resist Baby's takeover, and Baby claims he did not absorb all of Trunks' power. In order for Trunks to overpower Baby, he should be able to push back with his own power against Baby's parasite power of 510,000. Trunks does this by becoming a Super Saiyan and pushes the parasite out with his own willpower and at least matching babies. In order to reach that level, his base power should have remained to be multiplied. Thus, it's a very strong case that Baby failed to absorb any of Trunks' power due to him resisting so fast. On Earth is where the most broken power-ups in many characters take place. It's absolutely insane. Months do indeed go by and Earth life has been peaceful. Baby had arrived and had also absorbed the power from very weak beings on his journey. You can consider it similar to Imperfect Cell absorbing the humans, but at this point in GT, that's too insignificant to count. But things get incredibly interested when he shows up to fight Goten. Goten considers Baby to be in a completely different league from anybody they fought up until this point. This can imply Super Buu as that's the last enemy Goten technically fought. But there is also a chance he could be referring to Kid Buu due to him giving energy for the spirit bomb to defeat him, so he is aware of him. This doesn't matter which Boo, the fact that Goten acknowledges the baby is something else now, that's exactly what we expect and what we want. He's not wrong, but Goten is so incredibly powerful that he is able to casually handle baby 
who is at 510,000 Kid Buu. This would put Goten's base 50 times that of Trunks and Goku in one of the most insane showcases of power in Dragon Ball GT. GT Goten really is a beast here, and this is just in base. Don't blame me with how strong Goten is at this point, it's just how chaotic GT is. The problem with Goten is that he's lazy and enjoys the chilled life, but that doesn't stop his dormant potential being one of the strongest in Dragon Ball history. Despite his raw Super Saiyan power being more than enough to kill Baby, this was indeed Baby's trick to take over Goten's body due to his guard being lowered, and making it easier to take over a Super Saiyan. He lured him into becoming a Super Saiyan, and you can argue the reason why Baby took over Goten successfully and not Trunks, despite Goten's bigger power here, is mainly due to Goten's weaker mindset, distractions, that loving city life, dating girls, chilling out, whereas Trunks, during the last year, had been fighting alongside Goku in serious battles, and had far more willpower, a warrior spirit, to push out Baby from within, having a more fighting mindset. Plus, he was still in base form to begin with, making it more difficult for Baby to take control. So this explains why Super Saiyan Goten had no chance to fight back when Baby took the wheel. It was too late. So let's look at Super Saiyan Goten's power. If his base was able to take on Baby, who was 510,000 Kid Buu, this means his Super Saiyan form is 25,500,000 out of Kid Buu. And this is a lazy Goten. It makes you wonder what he would be like if he trained, but it also feels like a plot convenient power up. Some things just don't make sense, like Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu and Z. The plot convenient power ups just happen. So, how strong is Baby Goten? All we do is add Baby's parasite power to Goten's base and multiply the new power with Super Saiyan. So 510,000 plus Baby's 510,000 equals 1,020,000 times 50 for Super Saiyan, 51 million for Super Saiyan Baby Goten. We're only going to use Super Saiyan 1, not Super Saiyan 2, because I'm only going with what we see in GT. That keeps it fair to what's actually happening. The longer Baby stays inside Goten, the more power he's absorbing. So by the time he's ready to move on to the next stronger Saiyan, he's already absorbed the Saiyan power of the vessel he's in. Which means upon leaving Goten's body to fight Gohan, Baby is 510,000 plus Goten's Super Saiyan power of 25,500,000, making Baby 26,100,000 times stronger than Kid Buu. As he's adding chunks of power to get which brings us to Gohan, where even in the GT Perfect Files it states Gohan never neglected training. And it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Why, despite all this power from Goten, the baby still considers Gohan the next step in Stone of Power. Gohan in GT is incredible. GT Gohan could blink in base form and kill Kid Buu. Gohan Super Saiyan matched baby Super Saiyan Goten at 51 million, making base Gohan 1,020,000, twice as strong as regular Goten. The parasite jumps inside Gohan, and that would be 26,100,000, plus 1,020,000 for the new base, times 50 for Super Saiyan, which gives 1,356,000,000 for Baby Super Saiyan Gohan. How did Baby keep control over Gohan if he didn't neglect training? It's the same principle as Goten. He tricked Gohan to becoming a Super Saiyan, becoming more susceptible to infection and faster takeover. What do I always tell you guys? Stay in base. This is where shit gets insane. So Baby at 26,100,000 took over Gohan, where his Super Saiyan power was 51 million. We could use a theoretical Super Saiyan 2 Gohan, an ultimate form Gohan, go crazy, but let's go with what we just see. Keep it as Super Saiyan 1. The parasite body is now 7. 77,100,000 when it leaves Gohan. Anyway, time passes and Baby Gohan fights Vegeta. During the fight, possessed Goten shows up, but remember, Baby is no longer acting as the driver in Goten. He's driving Gohan. Goten is on his side due to an egg implanted deep within. He's not getting the main Baby buff anymore from the Parasite. Now, in terms of the battle, Vegeta fought both Gohan and Goten in an equal battle. It could have gone either way, thus giving us a reliable power for Vegeta being 1,356,000,000 plus... 25,500,000 for both Gohan and Goten, making Super Saiyan Vegeta 1,381,500,000 times stronger than Kid Buu, and his base form being 50 times less, so 27,630,000 for regular base form Vegeta. No wonder Baby refers to him as the mightiest Saiyan power. Eat your heart out, mustache haters. From here, it's simple to calculate Baby Vegeta's initial power. The parasite body of 77,100,000 jumps into Vegeta, creating a new base of 104,730,000. Multiply that by 50 for Super Saiyan, and Baby Super Saiyan Vegeta is 5,236,500,000. The highest power yet, nearly five times stronger than Baby Gohan Super Saiyan. And the parasite itself would grow even more from here.
But where is GT Goku in all of this? Well, months later, Goku arrives and one of his first fights is against Super Saiyan Gohan and Super Saiyan Goten. These are the actual fighters with just eggs in and no baby hosted. Therefore, we can only use Super Saiyan Goten and Super Saiyan Gohan's combined power of 76,500,000, which was dealt with successfully by Goku, one arm each, in base. Let me tell you why this right here is one of the most insane power jumps in not just GT, but Dragon Ball history. Goku is 76,500,000 times stronger than Kid Buu here, which means he is 7,650 times stronger than he was in the Rildo arc in base. Anyway, soon after Baby Vegeta shows up, and Goku becomes Super Saiyan 3 against Super Saiyan Baby Vegeta. Yes, this is Super Saiyan Baby Vegeta. The GT Perfect Files clearly states this white-haired version of Vegeta was a Super Saiyan 1. Plus, we do see base Baby Vegeta at Capsule Corp anyway. Super Saiyan Baby Vegeta was stated to be more than a match for Goku, actually tanking his hits and smiling, while Super Saiyan 3 Goku was taking heavy damage from Baby Super Saiyan 1. So we know Super Saiyan Baby 1 was far above Super Saiyan 3 Goku, and this helps us understand where both are in terms of growth. Multiplying base Goku's power of 76,500,000 out of Kid Buu by 400 for Super Saiyan 3 gives Super Saiyan 3 Goku a monstrous 30 billion 600 million. Stronger than Kid Buu, stronger than his Super Saiyan 3 self against Kid Buu. 30 billion times Universal Plus. Super Saiyan Baby Vegeta was only two times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku at most because he toyed with Super Saiyan 3 Goku and tanked his attacks. That's within the range it takes to dominate your opponent and tank them. This would mean Super Saiyan Baby Vegeta is 61 billion 200 million stronger than Kid Buu. This would mean base Baby Vegeta would be 1 billion 224 million. Super Saiyan 3 Goku would be 25 times stronger than base Baby Vegeta in this case for about 10 seconds though. This would mean Baby Vegeta got 11 times stronger since he first took over Vegeta and in terms of the parasite baby itself base baby Vegeta 1 billion 224 million minus Vegeta's normal base of 27 million 630 thousand equals the parasite itself being 1 billion 196 million 370 thousand times stronger than Kid Buu. So how the hell did baby get so strong in the weeks before Goku arrived? It just doesn't make any sense right? Well this is GT after all but you can make sense of it if you really want to using the concept of how the parasite baby works. You may ask yourself can baby just keep absorbing the same power once it replenishes and he's still inside the body? He's a parasite after all what's stopping him? We could indeed apply rollover absorptions here. So he's in Vegeta's body for a considerably longer time before Goku gets back from the Grand Tour. If he's constantly absorbing Vegeta's power into his own, letting it recharge, absorbing it again, he is indeed doing what a parasite actually does, stealing the goddamn energy to fuel itself. We can't really quantify it, but we know he destroys a low board Super Saiyan 3 Goku, a Goku who wiped Super Saiyan Gohan and Super Saiyan Goten. Baby could have kept absorbing Vegeta's energy for weeks whilst he was the host. But another in-story reason why we could apply to how Baby Vegeta got stronger in this time could be to him knowing Goku was still coming home, preparing to use Goku as a punch bag to take out his revenge. And he knew Goku's growing potential, so he prepared for him by taking advantage of the training equipment, a capsule corp. He's got Vegeta's memories, he knows how strong Goku will get. And Baby did live with everyone daily once Earth was taken over. Perhaps he used Vegeta's body to train in this time, or it's just a plot convenient power-up. So there are three options there for his growth. Let's move on to Super Baby. Now Baby destroys Goku and Baby proceeds to power up further. Gohan, Goten, Trunks and Bulla give all of their energy to Vegeta's body first and then the Parasite takes the power of the body it's in. That's the order of how things work because it's Vegeta's body undergoing the transformations. So let's work out the strength of Vegeta's body without Baby. Vegeta's base alone 27,630,000. Super Saiyan Vegeta alone 1,381,500,000. And then we have the combined power of Gohan, Goten, Trunks and Buller at 77,010,000 times stronger than Kid Buu. As I said previously, check out my last videos, you'll know why they're that strong. Vegeta takes the power thus making it his new base. It does not add to the already magnified Super Saiyan power because a power of 77 million Kid Buu literally makes no difference to Super Saiyan Vegeta. It goes to the base of Vegeta and then the Super Saiyan power magnifies the new base. That's how Super Saiyan works, it's just a magnifier of the power already there with a visual change. And if you need more evidence on this, wait till my next episode 
episode on Super Saiyan 4 and how the Saiyan ritual works when powering up Super Saiyan 4. Anyway, with this combined power of the others, Vegeta's new base power is 104,640,000. His Super Saiyan form, 5,232,000,000. His Super Saiyan 2 form, 10,464,000,000. Vegeta's body then absorbs all the power of the humans. That power we are unable to quantify. We know it's something, but I won't include that. But what I will include is Vegeta's Super Saiyan 3 form, and that puts that power at 41 billion 856 million times that of Kid Buu. But that's just Vegeta's body alone. Let's add Baby the Parasite to it. That goddamn parasite. So we take the parasite power of 1,196,370,000 plus Vegeta's base form power of 104,640,000 making base baby Vegeta's new base power 1,301,010,000 times that of Kid Buu. Super Saiyan baby Vegeta would be 65,050,500,000 Super Baby or Super Saiyan 2, would be 130 billion, 101 million, and Super Baby 2, technically Super Saiyan 3, is 520 billion, 404 million times that of Kid Buu. Making Super Baby 2 17 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku at this point, and Goku gets sent to the next dimension. Some time passes, after defeating Goku for the first time, Baby would eventually absorb all of this new power of Vegeta's body into his parasite body because that's what a goddamn parasite does. That's how he stated to work in GT. Official dialogue. So the parasite body, what it was, was 1,196,370,000 plus Vegeta's own maximum Super Saiyan 3 strength of 41,856,000,000 equals 43,052,370,000 times that of Kid Buu for just the Parasite. Which means after the time is passing, Vegeta's base heals back up. So you add the 104,640,000 of Vegeta's base onto the new Parasite power for new base baby Vegeta to be 43,157,010,000. The Parasite is carrying most of the weight in terms of the base power now. He could just leave Vegeta's body at this rate, but there's a whole story plot of why he retains Vegeta's body in terms of his revenge. Anyway, Super Baby 2 is 400 times that power, making him a monster. Monstrous 17 trillion 262 billion 804 million times stronger than Kid Buu. Super Baby 2 is 33 times stronger than he was before, and now he would be 564 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku. Dragon Ball GT has many concepts that are based on various aspects of culture, mythologies, or traditions. One you may already be aware of is Goku's change state during the ending of Dragon Ball GT. Essentially, according to Taoism, Goku ascended to a new plane of existence, was dead yet living and immortal. And it is said when someone ascends to heaven in broad daylight in mythology, they ride to the heavens on the back of a dragon. But Goku did not go to the same heaven as other world, but to another type of heaven. Another concept in GT known as Sugoroku space, some say Sugoroku space, it doesn't really matter, where the naming convention is based off a Japanese board game, along with a being inside known as Sugoro. And this makes sense because Goku ends up in a board game there, but that's just the name inside of things. The concept of the episodes after Goku's assumed death after fighting baby Vegeta is derived from a Japanese Buddhist tradition. This is known as the River Sanzu, which basically means river of three paths. And it's about before reaching the afterlife, the souls of the deceased must cross the river to get to the other side by means of one of three crossing points, a bridge, a ford, no not the car, or a stretch of deep snake infested waters. The weight of one's offenses while alive determines which path an individual must take. It is believed that a toll must be paid before a soul can cross the river. Only the dead can cross the river on a Shinigami's boat if they can afford to pay. Everything except Shinigami and their boats will sink. The river is populated by phantoms of extinct marine life, including those from prehistoric times. Shinigami are death gods inspired by the Grim Reaper. This all sounds like one big risky game, doesn't it? Just like episodes 30 and 31 of Dragon Ball GT. And this all begins to make sense, as the board game in Sugoroku Space is literally a crossing, where Goku has to play a game and take risks to get to the destination, which is the door at the end. 
When Goku first arrives in Sugoroku space in episode 30 and 31 of GT, he is confronted by Sugoru and even asks him, does the river Sanzu flow near here? And Sugoro replies that this place can be even more perilous than the river Sanzu. So that's where they even added it in the dialogue to help us, the audience, make that connection of the river Sanzu tradition and the concept of the episodes. The scary voices that can be heard in Sugoroku space are the ones in charge of that area. We never see their faces, but their authoritative presence of controlling everything, even having a hold over Goku's power, and creating games that beings are forced to play makes their concept similar to the Shinigami, the Death Gods, in where they are making judgment on whoever is in that dimension. Whether it's for amusement or fairness is unknown. And this makes sense why the Supreme Kai's power was stated to not have any hold over that place, because Death Gods pretty much have the final say, and would you really want to mess with the guy who decides if you live or die? And no, this is not the same as King Yemma. Beings are already dead by the time they get to him. He decides what plane they get on. The Death Gods work in the unknown and have made their decision before souls even get to that check-in station, if you want to think of it like that. But the main concept in which Sugoroku Space is identical to is that it's Dragon Ball's concept of Limbo. And what is Limbo exactly? It's a place without heaven nor hell and without life or death. It's when a being hasn't made it to heaven but not enough to send them to hell. It's nothingness. The idea of Limbo is that we float around like Casper the Friendly Ghost in some netherworld plane of existence where we work off our sins. This is an illogical idea and the product of a man's vain imagination but Goku doesn't really have sins so it doesn't make sense for Goku to go there naturally. It was more to do with Kibito Kai's butterfingers. Even though Kibito Kai dropped Goku due to the force of Baby Vegeta's death ball, Goku was literally on the brink of death beforehand, and as a concept for the episodes, it fits perfectly for Goku to be in a place where he's being judged and forced to play in order to see if his time is actually up. But the idea in itself also links to how the Space Lemmas were forced to win so many matches in GT to get out, like paying off their sins. It really sounds like the Death Gods in Sugoroku Space were just sick and twisted. Now we understand the concept of Sugoroku Space, let's talk about the cosmology of the Sugoroku Space. It's an endless area between dimensions. It's also stated to be between time and space itself, meaning it's not actually a dimension, and it's not time and it's not space. It's only called Sugoroku Space for naming convention. It's often referred to as an area and called space for our own comprehension. It's basically nothing. But I will refer to it as a dimension just for ease in this video. A dimension of nothing. But it is an endless area between dimensions, time and space regardless. And it's an area where you're stated to wander forever. Wander in the most basic understanding of motion is to just move forward in a straight line. And you will wander forever. And forever meaning there is no end. No aging, no time, not even death. No end. Forever. This also supports it being between time. And if you want to get specific why this place has no actual time, the son of Sugoru that is in there is still just a child because he's Goten in disguise. And he and his father have been there for so long that they have managed to complete 32,974,572 games. Well, let's just say even if an average game is 10 minutes, that would take over 600 years in actual time to complete one after another non-stop. These space lemmas, which are actually called ordinary space tanuki, are mortal creatures where tanuki literally means Japanese raccoon dogs. And they are not immortal by concept. And if you want to get very specific, during the GT special 100 years later, which is officially part of the GT continuity, it literally states no one from back then is alive during the GT special, which would literally include Sugoro. So the child wouldn't even live another 100 years, let alone spend 600 years in Sugoroku space and not even become an adult Tanuki in the process. This proves Sugoroku space has no time and the Tanuki were kept there the same as they went in until they finish the game. And that literally supports the statement where Sugoroku space is between time and space itself. And the statement of wandering forever in that void sounds more like World of Void every day, doesn't it? Imagine the voice we heard inside Sugoroku space was the Grand Priest making judgment and GT Goku destroyed his creation. Sign this boy up for the tournament of power real fast. 
We don't know how many of these areas actually exist, probably as many as there are different space times to be in between of. It's essentially nothing, it's emptiness, absolute nothing. And if you really want to compare concepts to other Dragon Ball material, it's exactly the same concept as the World of Void. Nothing. Supreme Kai's had the key to the whole city, and this means the dimension of nothingness is more powerful than anything in the 4D universe. As I explained, there are unknown beings at play in this dimension. We never see them, but we know Suguro refers to him, and when he finds out they cheated, multiple angry voices can be heard in that dimension, and they threaten to make Goku and Suguro wander between dimensions forever. I will just refer to these voices as death gods because that's pretty much what they are. Playing games and making stipulations on how someone will live or die like they did with Suguro. The board game area could be one of an infinite number of games created for other beings who have almost died or slipped into that area. It's not just for Goku or Suguro. The death gods start destroying the board game because Suguro cheated. They don't actually start destroying the dimension. That's a false analysis. The endless area is where the death gods want to make Goku and Sugura wander in forever. It makes absolutely no sense why the boss would destroy the very place they want to keep Goku in. It's just the board game that's collapsing and that board game is within the endless space that's still intact. When the board game starts collapsing, this gives Goku a moment where the game no longer has any hold over Goku's power. He begins to fly and is finally confident that everything is going to be okay because he plans to end this with his key. The fact that this place had initially been able to take hold of Goku's power should go to show you how powerful this dimension actually is. And base Goku one-shots it. No, not the game. If just the game was destroyed, Goku would still wander the dimension forever, and that's exactly what the Death Gods were in the process of doing. Destroying the game wouldn't have been enough for their safety. Goku had to do something else to survive. Goku charges a Kamehameha in base form and one-shots the whole dimension, destroying it entirely, which forced him and Suguro to pop into the next nearest dimension, which was luckily the space of the living universe, where Kabido Kai could then finally sense him and save his monkey. He asked. What dimensions was Sugoroku space in between? Living world was one of them. That's all we need to know. Doesn't really matter. Some oddly downplay this feat and want to believe that Goku just destroyed a small pocket dimension that was already falling apart, but that's incorrect. Because if you go with that, then why didn't Goku just wait for the dimension to crumble to escape anyway? Why resort to a blast? That makes absolutely no sense. The Death Gods literally said he was about to make them wander in between dimensions forever whilst destroying the game they were inside of. You can literally see the board game opening up and beyond that is the endless void Goku is going to be dropped into. Look at it. It's there visually. Goku one-shotted the whole damn place. Goku one-shotted the whole limbo. So just how insane is the potential of Goku's feat here? Well, after destroying Sugoroku's space, even as a massive low ball, Goku performed a universal plus feat by destroying infinity. But going by the cosmology of what Sugoroku's space actually is, Limbo, World of Void, an endless area between time and space, Goku's power in base form is far above Universal Plus. Now you can argue GT Goku has immeasurable speed from this feat. Moving in a space that has no time is considered to have immeasurable speed or being beyond linear time. And existing where no space present would make you 4D and adding no time would make you 5D. Being able to be alive and move in a realm that doesn't have space or time is a 5D feat. As being able to exist within a place without time, then you must transcend time itself. And Goku's power did just that. Despite him being in the collapsing game, Goku's Kamehameha and power managed to go through the game, destroying the entire area outside of it, the whole Sugoroku space, proving that his power is capable of transcending everything within that dimension. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist to destroy the place. But what about Sugoro? Does this make them 5D because they were also able to move, right? Well, no, not exactly. Because they only moved within the board game created for them by the Death Gods. They did not have the power to blow up the dimension and didn't have any power to act outside of the game. But Goku did once he gained access to his power once again. This was why the Lemmas were so surprised at Goku's power growing. If the board game fully disappeared, the Space Lemmas would have got lost forever. But the fact the game was still barely there was enough to allow 
allow them to stop moving the collapsing area, like a sinking ship, if you need that visual comparison. And because Goku destroyed the limbo itself, made them all pop into the next closest dimension, the main universe, before anything else happened. Remember, Goku had absolutely no fear when he got use of his key again, which should tell you something about just how strong he really is. Not only that, when Goku and the Space Lammers popped back into the main universe, moments before they got rescued by Kabito Kai, Goku was laying in the middle of space itself, with no spacesuit, no ship, and acting completely normal, smiling and open in his mouth. I even think he gasped, without any worry. Think about how incredible that is for a moment. Goku can survive in space now? But for everyone else that could match base Goku's power of 76,500,000 times that of Kid Buu, they can be considered in the same dimension of power and also, 5D. Does it make sense based on the history of growth of these characters? I don't care. Senseless things happen in Dragon Ball all the time. Universe 6 Saiyans, who don't even know Cell Saga transformations, can take on Super Saiyan gods with ease. So I don't need to explain that point any further in terms of Dragon Ball sense. And do you want to know how Goku got into Limbo in the first place? Baby Vegeta's Revenge Death Ball Shockwave is so powerful it makes Goku drop into different dimensions of space and time and was even able to warp through Kabito Kai's instant teleportation to the point Goku drops into a different space-time dimension. And this is done by Super Baby 2. Think about how much stronger Goku gets from there. And this makes perfect sense that such a blast is devastating to outperform instant transmission because GT Goku already inherits the feat to move within instant transmission and movie that links to the GT verse because Cooler is in GT. Two second appearance, it doesn't matter, they still put him in there. All the villains Goku has killed. And that feat makes Goku's combat speed inaccessible. Unless you have inaccessible speed in the GT verse, you ain't hitting this guy. Goku is moving faster than no time, meaning GT Goku will forever and always move faster than those who cannot do the same feat. Interestingly, the Death Ball is also stated to act exactly like the concept of Hakai, in which it destroys in such a way that you cannot be revived back from it due to it erasing your existence entirely. This is GT's version of Destroyer Energy, and GT Goku gets it's insanely more powerful than that level. So do you guys want to know the power of Oob and how he compares to Super Baby 2? Remember the last time we saw Oob, he was 200 times that the power of Kid Buu, right at the start of GT. This was one year ago in the story. And in that time, he grows so goddamn powerful. Yes, Oob was booked terribly in GT, but his power potential lives up to the prophecy. You see, Oob shows up in base form and kicks Super Baby 2 back, blocking, punching, dodging him, already doing better than what Super Saiyan 3 Goku could do against Super Saiyan 1 Baby Vegeta some time ago. It's already implied Oob's base form is above Super Saiyan 3 Goku at this point. Put in Oob at least 30 billion 600 million times that of Kid Buu. Oob grew at least 153 million times stronger in nearly one year from doing push-ups in his village. That's insane. Now, he combines with Fat Buu, becoming, as some people like to say, Majub, and is able to become a serious threat to Super Baby 2 and engages in a beam struggle. Now, please note, Baby Vegeta wins this beam struggle. But to outclass an opponent somewhat and then even hold the beam struggle against someone who is 564 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku, that is insane power, man. Now, Baby could not not tank Majub's attacks, thus meaning he is definitely not two times stronger than him. In fact, a domination multiplier is considered at least 1.25 times in order to start becoming dominant in battle. And it was clear Baby wasn't immediately dominant. It took some time to gradually overcome Oob in the beam struggle, who plot-wise allowed himself to be absorbed to defeat Baby from within. And you know what? It probably would have worked if Baby didn't become an Uzaru and got stronger. Majub could be closer to Super Baby 2 than we give him credit for, but let's go with Super Baby being 1.25 times stronger than Oob. Majub, of course. Put in Majub's power at 13,810,243,200,000 times that of Kid Buu and 451 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku. Where we can say 451 times is the power of the Buu and Oob fusion. That is insane power. Oob is a goddamn monster. I just wish he was treated more like a prodigy than Garden Waste after this.
Super Saiyan 3 Goku with his tail is still 30 billion 600 million because it was clearly stated by Baby Vegeta that Goku has not grown stronger with the tail during their second battle. And he should know it is reliable dialogue because he's already fought this power previously. It's not empty dialogue. Super Baby 2 being 564 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku deals with him with ease. But now this is where it gets fun. You see, the Golden Uzaru is incredibly interesting. It's not just Super Saiyan plus Uzaru in terms of multipliers. That mere amp of 500 times base form would never close a gap between base Goku and baby. 500 times was just fan theories and they just wanted it to make sense. Ooh, Super Saiyan. Ooh, Uzaru. 10 times times 50. No, it's not quite that underwhelming, Scholar. The Golden Uzaru, or should I call it the original Super Saiyan of Legend, is its own standalone new form with its own perks and multiplier. You just have to read the dialogue rather than be lazy and read a Reddit page. And let me tell you, it's goddamn awesome. Golden Uzaru Goku caused Baby to go into a panic and kept him on the defense. Yes, he remembered what the Saiyans did to the Tuffles in the past, but he quickly regained his composure knowing he's far surpassed the warriors of the past. So Baby being in fear is out of the question. It was overcome. So he charges up his revenge death ball and goes for the attack, but Golden Uzaru Goku counterattacks and smashed Baby into a stunned state. Baby quickly admits that Golden Uzaru is incredible in terms of power to the point where Baby is completely outclassed and all his black do is cripple a building, causing the golden Uzaru to fall over like a drunken ape. That's it. He even blasts the ape in the face and all it does is make him slip and then he regroups anyway. Baby continuously avoids the ape's attacks. So there is absolutely no way Baby surpasses the raw power of the Golden Ape. Furthermore, it's stated the Golden Uzaru's power keeps increasing. The dialogue literally says that, and that's another insane perk to this form. Truly given a nod at the original Super Saiyan of Legend and how it destroyed himself in its own frenzy of increasing power. We really don't know how far the Golden Ape's power could go in that state until it either destroys itself or the rationale is controlled. But how much stronger is Golden Uzaru to Baby? Because it's quite clear he is. He is able to dominate the tuffle to the point where he's tanking baby's attacks without damage well the showcase of dominance is similar to super saiyan 1 baby versus super saiyan 3 goku in their first fight where we put baby as times two for toying around and tanking golden ape goku is literally having a wild time and taking the piss out of baby vegeta in terms of power i'm easily putting him at two times super baby 2 for those reasons but it could be a lot more in terms of his ever-growing raw power and this puts golden uzaru goku at 34 trillion 520 25 billion 608 million times stronger than Kid Buu and this equates to 1128 times stronger than the power of Goku Super Saiyan 3 and this is the best part 451,315 times from base form. That is the multiplier of the Golden Uzaru. Nearly half a million and rising. Beautiful. Very fitting for the legendary Super Saiyan of Legend transformation. Now, when it comes to Great Ape Baby versus Super Saiyan 4 Goku, in the first round, it's mentioned by the old Kai that Goku has the edge in speed, but Baby has the edge in power. Now, this is extremely inconsistent in the fight because you get both of them overpowering each other in different ways, to the point Goku can literally, with raw power, bust out of Baby's hold and throw him around the planet. Plus, the two eventually knock each other out to a draw. So yeah, slapping a power multiplier on either of these to make them greater than each other is messy and unreliable so it's in the best interest for everyone watching that we place super saiyan 4 goku and great ape baby in the same bracket of power and relative to each other now, Super Baby 2 was exposed to 1,000 times the normal amounts of Brute's waves it takes than a normal Great Ape gets. It's important to note Baby succumbed to an unnatural Uzaru transformation. This is also backed up when the old Kai states Baby was suffering internally from the overload, as shown with a redness in his eyes, something was different, and it's no surprise Goku's 10 times Kamehameha didn't have any initial effect on Baby because Baby's body was literally in overdrive, doing overtime, until his body eventually gave out on him and he crashed and burned from the effects of the attack. You see, the moon is like a battery pack to the Uzaru's power. If you cut off the battery and the source of power, they revert back and lose the power amp, proving they need the battery to stay amped. Normal Brutes waves provide the 10 times power amp. 1,000 times the Brutes is like 1,000 power packs of power that Baby absorbs unnaturally. The Brutes waves 
do grant power as shown when replenishing baby's lost power later on. If you don't want to believe that 1000 times brute waves provide that much more of a power amp, allow me to provide further evidence that it is a legit power up amp. Look at it like this. If Goku absorbed 1000 times the amount of his own Super Saiyan power from his friends, yes, we would need a lot of Super Saiyans, but let's say he absorbed 1000 times the power of his Super Saiyan power. That's literally 50 times times a thousand. It becomes his power permanent or temporary, depending on the plot, but it does become his power. An example of this is in Dragon Ball Super with the failed Super Saiyan God ritual. Goku just absorbed the power of his friends. Goku's power skyrocketed to levels never reached previously after taking more energy than his normal allowance. This happens numerous times throughout Dragon Ball, and I'm sure you can come up with another example. So if normal Brute's waves amps the Saiyan body by 10 times, 1000 times the power amp would be an unnatural 10,000 times power amp from Bulma's Brute's Waves machine. And this was so strong that Baby didn't even need a tail to absorb the Brute's Waves. But this is where it gets crazy. Great Ape Baby is not just a regular Uzaru. No, no. He's a goddamn golden Uzaru, which we worked out to be a multiplier of 451,315 times base form. Goku becomes a golden Uzaru through normal Brute's Waves from the Earth. But Baby gets 1,000 times normal Brute's Waves, meaning it's 1,000 times the Golden Uzaru Power Amp. And that is 451,315,000 times base form for the unnatural Golden Ape. Golden Great Ape Baby is a ridiculous 19 quintillion, 477 quadrillion, 405 trillion, 968 billion, 150 million times stronger than Kid Buu. In order for Goku to match Great Ape Baby, in the first round, Goku's base form needs to be amplified from 76,500,000 to 19 quintillion, 477 quadrillion, 405 trillion, 968 billion, 150 million times that of Kid Buu. Because that is Great Ape Baby's power, and it equals a frightening multiplier for Super Saiyan 4 of being 254,606,613,962 times that from base form initially. Unfortunately, this isn't the true Super Saiyan 4 multiplier that we want, because later on, Goku obtains a level called Super Full Power Saiyan 4 and is way stronger than Great Ape Baby. So, whatever power he's using to fight Baby in the beginning is not a true representation of what Super. Super Full Power Saiyan 4 is. Some like to think Full Power Saiyan 4 is literally Super Saiyan 4 at full power, where he was never full power to begin with in the fight. Some like to think it's just Goku breaking his Super Saiyan 4 limits and reaching a new grade of Super Saiyan 4 that has a larger multiplier. Some like to think Goku had a Super Zenkai boost once he's healed because he's Super Saiyan 4. There's a lot of theories. Not even the show explains it that well. So for the purpose of this video, and again for the sake of the viewers, I'll just be given Super Full Power Saiyan 4 its own multiplier from the same base power of Goku because it's stated by Goku himself that he wants to return to full power, meaning only replenishing what's been lost throughout the fight. Why it gets so much stronger, I'll leave that part up to you. GT makes no sense. Now, after Baby and Super Saiyan 4 Goku are knocked out in the first round, Baby receives the Brute's Waves and gets restored back to 100%. There is no additional power-up, nothing is stated. He literally goes back to full power and crushes the weakened Goku, who at this point would stand no chance. But sometime after, Goku receives a power-up from Trunks, Gohan, Goten, and Pan, requesting their power in order to go Super Full Power Saiyan 4. Now, how can these four replenish Goku if Super Saiyan 4 is leagues above them in terms of scaling? Well, it's simple. All the others do is provide power for Goku to replenish his base power to 100%. If the base is 100%, any form a character has just magnifies it. We have to remember, Super Saiyan forms, including 4, is a cloak of power over a base form. What you see isn't the true person, but rather a magnification of the base power with a visual change. So the Super Saiyan power of everyone is converted and projected to Goku to use to replenish his base form underneath Super Saiyan 4, where Super Saiyan 4 then multiplies it. There's no way in hell Gohan, Trunks, Goten, and Pan equal Super Saiyan 4 in terms of power. So the way I just said is the best way to understand them healing Goku. And get this, the combined maximum power of Super Saiyan Trunks, Goten, Gohan, and Base Pan is nearly the same as it was when they provided their power to Baby previously. We just swap out Buller and Pan, which doesn't make that much difference. And this means the three Super Saiyans plus Pan have a combined power of 77 million, 
10,000 times that of Kid Buu. Now get this, Goku's base form power is 76,500,000 times that of Kid Buu. This is literally like poetry. It's the perfect amount of Saiyan power to replenish Goku's base power to 100% so that Super Saiyan 4 can magnify it at full power. It's stated that Kabido Kai doesn't have what it takes to revive Super Saiyan 4. Judging by Goku's base being 77 million beyond Kid Buu, and Kabido Kai is not even one-tenth of one single Kid Buu, is this even a surprising statement? So just how strong is this disgusting monkey after reaching this 100% level? No, it's not 10 times Super Saiyan 3. Let me show you why Super Full Power Saiyan 4 is leagues above Great Ape Baby. But what we need for this is to work out how strong Baby's final revenge death ball is. It is critical. Great Ape Baby powered up a stronger variant of the revenge death ball called Final Revenge Death Ball. You remember the domination multiplier, right? being roughly 1.25 times stronger than the opponent to dominate the battle, but more than two times to show significant ability to tank attacks, well, Goku was able to tank a revenge death ball from Baby. This wasn't any ordinary revenge death ball. It was the ultimate version, the blazing death ball. Key attacks can amp the power of the user significantly. For example, Goku goes from a power level of 416 to 924 after using a full power Kamehameha against Raditz. 2.2 times stronger. Another example is in the Saiyan Saga, Kaioken times 3 at 24,000, Vegeta at full power, 18,000. Goku was 1.3 times stronger than Vegeta there, but if you give Goku a 2 times 2 boost for the Kamehameha, it makes Goku 3.5 times stronger than Saiyan Saga Vegeta's 18,000 power level. Vegeta closed that gap with one Gallic Gun, proving some attacks can boost the power of the user up to 3.5 times the normal power, especially the Gallic Gun. When it comes to Uzai, Zaru Baby, he used the Super Gallic Gun. In fact, in the first round, the only way Goku could retaliate to a Super Gallic Gun was by reverting to a 10 times Kamehameha, which is stated to be 10 times the power of a normal one. So the 10 times Kamehameha is 22 times Goku's power instead of 2.2. How strong does the Super Gallic Gun need to be in order to be relevant to a 22 times boost? We have 22 divided by a normal Gallic Gun of 3.5, which gives us 6.2 times for the Super Gallic Gun. But after Goku became Super Full Power Saiyan 4, Baby reused the Super Gallic Gun followed by a continuous Super Gallic Gun Assault, and none of them affected Full Power Saiyan 4. He smiled as they just blew up in his face. This immediately puts Full Power Saiyan 4 not just 6.2 times that of Uzaru Baby, but 12.4 times stronger because he needed to be at least two times to tank the Super Gallic Gun. Now, if Baby realized his 6.2 times power didn't work on Goku, or whatever power he felt that was, he wouldn't then go and use a weaker attack. He would use a stronger attack because he realizes he needs something stronger to deal with that level of Goku. He creates the final revenge death ball, which he knows needs to be a challenging power of at least 12.4 times the amp in order to deal with this new power of Goku that tanked a super Gallic gun. Baby knows the feeling of levels of power. He has Vegeta's memories and understanding. He knows what's needed. The final revenge death ball could be more than a 12.4 increase, but we'll go in line with the calculations we've made as we won't have anything to back up a stronger increase. So Baby's 19 quintillion power times 12.4 for the Revenge Death Ball makes the attack 241 quintillion, 519 quadrillion, 834 trillion, 5 billion, 60 million times that of Kid Buu. I wonder how much stronger Cauliflower is to Kid Buu. She has to be more than that in order to take that attack from Grade 8 Baby. But just for fun, let me know how much stronger she is to Kid Buu. I want a goddamn number. Let's get over to the real power of Super Full Power Saiyan 4. Baby launches this attack at Goku. There is no pushback or struggle debates in this situation. Goku enters the raw power of the final revenge death ball and does more than tank the attack. He soaks up the attack and absorbs it after bathing in its own power. He required no beam struggle to cancel the blast. He did it with his raw body, making him at least two times the super revenge death ball's power for doing more than a basic tank. We could go even higher, but let's keep it at times two. Super full power Saiyan 4 Goku is 483 quintillion, 39 quadrillion, 668 trillion, 10 billion, 120 million times that of Kid Buu. 
And to work out the multiplier of Super Full Power Saiyan 4, it's that number divided by Goku's base power of 76,500,000 times that of Kid Buu to get a Grand Slam Super Full Power Saiyan 4 multiplier of 6 trillion. 314,244,026,276 times base form. That is the multiplier of 100% Super Saiyan 4 and is 24.8 times stronger than the first Super Saiyan 4 multiplier we had when he first transformed. Goku uses his 10 times Kamehameha on Baby and annihilates him, putting the 10 times Kamehameha at 10 sextillion, 626 quintillion, 872 quadrillion, 696 trillion, 222 billion, 640 million times that of Kid Buu's power making this attack 528 times stronger than Great Ape Baby. No wonder it won the game. Now the Parasite Baby manages to get out of Vegeta's body, but how much stronger is the Parasite now after being inside Golden Ape Vegeta? While it's not known how much power he absorbed when he turned into the Great Ape, we can assume he absorbed some of the power, but we don't know how much. He went straight into battle with Goku, but no matter how much he absorbed, it will never be above Super Saiyan 4 Goku at this point, which is why he tried to escape from Goku. If we consider the Parasite body alone, is still at 43,052,370,000 times that of Kid Buu's power whilst he was still part of Super Baby 2, then this puts full power Super Saiyan 4 Goku at 10,857,886,412 times power more than the Parasite itself. Goodbye, baby. Have a great day. But if Vegeta got up fresh there and then, baby would be 1,558 times stronger than base Vegeta and 3.8 times stronger than a theoretical Super Saiyan 3 Vegeta. Baby would also take out everyone else except Majub. Majub could take Baby the Parasite here alone. No contest. Majub is now 320 times more than just the Parasite Baby. So there's a win there for the Oob fans. Plus he was the final save to help Goku win the arc. Thumbs up for Oob. GT is the continuation of the Z anime, which carries over many broken displays of power, including all of the filler. Whatever happens in the Z anime matters for GT, and if you want to include the movie verse, you can. It's completely optional, but there are ways to link the movies to GT, despite any inconsistencies you may encounter. Dragon Ball's middle name is inconsistent. There are inconsistencies in all continuities of Dragon Ball. Worrying about the inconsistencies from movies to GT are the least of our worries. But like I said, it's completely optional. GT Goku doesn't rely on the movie feats to be as strong as he is. GT does that for him alone, including some of the best lifting feats known to Dragon Ball, pushing and holding over 200,000 tons in base form for a few seconds, then lifting half of a city from underneath as Super Saiyan 4, and so on. Movie feats just allow him to gain some additional power and speed feats early on, such as inaccessible speed from the return of Cooler Movie, because Super Saiyan Goku could move within instant transmission. That movie happened because Cooler is in GT. That continuation of Dragon Ball makes GT Goku have inaccessible speed and anyone as strong or stronger than Super Saiyan Goku versus Cooler in that continuity. The Super 17 saga is a crucial arc to GT because the saga involves critical scenes of the Dragon Ball's minus energy as well as it effect in the universe. Key plot points to GT. The villains are there because of the movies. GT Goku also utilizes the very unique Dragon Fist in GT, where he also used it in Wrath of the Dragon. Proof that this Goku has his own continuity. The movies and anime going into GT. Fusion Reborn is canon to GT also, since Vegeta already knows about the fusion dance technique in GT. There is never any explanation or writing how Vegeta in GT knew the fusion dance, except headcanon. Therefore, Fusion Reborn stands as the most reliable time Vegeta learned it, and many years after that was so proficient in executing it that he could perform it in mid-air and under pressure. 
There are many inconsistencies in the Fusion Reborn movie, including the scene with Vegeta's soul that can go against linking it to GT. But again, inconsistencies do not invalidate the movies being linked to GT because GT can counteract that by what it validates in the movies. GT validates the existence of pretty much every main movie in Dragon Ball Z that has inconsistencies in them, which would include Fusion Reborn. It even goes to the point of strengthening the continuity of Fusion Reborn actually happening because it doesn't include Janemba in Hell's Raid because he was erased from existence by Gogeta. In Fusion Reborn, Goku is able to shake the entire afterlife, consisting of different space times and Morelm and Hell, in essence, shaking infinity, which is made of four different space times. And this immediately makes Super Saiyan 3 Goku at this point Universal Plus because he is significantly affecting the space time of the universe and also warping the reality of Hell itself. Janemba was also doing the same where Fat Janemba does it simply by existing. Super Saiyan 3 Goku was able to keep up in the beginning. Furthermore, from the perspective of the movie, a theoretical Fat Boo in this movie would also be able to showcase the same Universal Plus feat as Super Saiyan 3 Goku because of their power being relative to each other. Wrath of the Dragon, which takes place sometime after Kid Buu's defeat, showcases Goku's Super Saiyan 3 is stronger than Ultimate Gohan. Even if Gohan didn't continue training after Buu, that would create sleep in power. Yet he still accessed the ultimate form which awakens the sleep in power. To further support why Gohan wouldn't decrease in power in this amount of time is by using the Bojack movie. Months passed after Cell where Gohan didn't train, but when he unlocked Super Saiyan 2, he demonstrated the same monstrous power as before. Which brings us to the Super 17 saga and another great Universal Plus feat where base Goku casually powers up and shakes heaven and hell. This is another classic feat that some people love to downplay, but the answer is as clear as day. The universe is comprised of four space-time continuums, shaking the dimensions that Goku did, not just shaking, but ragdolling them viciously. Whilst casually powering up in base form is significantly affecting them, making it a Universal Plus feat. Definition-wise, it classes as Universal Plus, despite it not involving direct destruction. Now imagine he used the same power he did in Sugoroku's space, explosive power, not aura power. Base GT Goku is more than capable of busting the universe with explosive raw power if his casual aura significantly affects two infinite space times. Hell also has has multiple layers or realms within itself as shown in GT. Hell itself is possibly multiple infinities. And even though I don't use the dub for my explanations, I will plug it in here just for fun. Where King Yamasetti, power like base GT Goku, he'll blow heaven to smithereens. And this was when Goku was in hell. So the dub of GT actually makes Goku's feet here low multiversal, just powering up in base form, not even fighting. Just think about his potential at max power in base form and then Super Saiyan 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4. It's no joke. Goku said he did it by accident. Now you can truly see why a few label in Super Saiyan 4 Goku as a multi-galaxy level fighter is incredibly inaccurate and plain ignorant. They just didn't watch the damn show. One thing I will debunk is the incorrect analysis of the General Rildo versus Base Gohan fight. Gohan was not weaker in this fight at all. In fact, if anything, General Rildo proves that villains can get stronger in hell, but in no way was Gohan weaker than Rildo. Power-wise, it was inconclusive. Gohan stepped up to Rildo and was ready. He can sense power. Goku and Trunks sense Roldo, so Gohan can too. Gohan wouldn't step up like he did if he had no confidence. Gohan took absolutely no damage from Roldo's attacks and only lost because he was outsmarted by Roldo's metal technique, which completely threw Gohan off his game. Because then Oob one-shots General Roldo and the metal is removed from Gohan. Gohan is smiling and happy with zero damage. And this is base Gohan, who could very well be stronger than Roldo here. He was just careless. But interestingly, Rildo has gone from roughly 10,000 times that of Kid Buu to somewhere closer to Gohan's base of 1 million times stronger than Kid Buu. Nearly 100 times stronger in roughly a year. Just how strong are the two Android 17s in GT? It's not just two Android Saga 17s. 
Let's look at Earth-17. Firstly, this guy had decimated base Trunks, a Trunks who was last calculated to be 10,000 times that of Kid Buu whilst in the baby arc. That's his base form. Earth-17 is already one shot in the entire Dragon Ball Z cast, and most of early GT, but that's only how far we can scale him because he doesn't do anything else except fuse. Oh, and kill Krillin, but Hellfighter 17 is so much stronger than this. It's stated that Android 17 is literally having the power of Hell poured into him. You could argue if 17 is powered up by a universe-sized realm, he would be either universal or universal plus. He and Hell 17's power-up combine the living world with the afterlife, merging two universes together is multiversal. This is stated in the story that this feat actually happened as well. Let's look at Hellfighter 17. He is not an ordinary 17. He's an artificial human with machine mutant upgrades created by Dr. Mew and Jiro, who had both been spying on Goku ever since the Baby Saga battles. Dr. Mew's knowledge and experience goes a long way, including his involvement in the creation of Baby, as well as knowing how strong Super Saiyan 4 Goku and Baby Vegeta were. And we all know how deadly that was. Now, in order to work out Hellfighter 17's power, we need to know Vegeta. Vegeta's power, and we should fast forward to a scene with Majub versus Super Samadine. Once Super Samadine forms, Majub's attacks aren't even able to make Super Samadine move from his position, not flinch, not react. Super Samadine wiped the dust from his boots whilst Majub was hitting him from behind. This is absolutely insane because this makes Super Saiyan Vegeta more relative to Majub than we think. Yes, Super Saiyan Vegeta is still fought at the Super 17, but the fact he was able to push Super 17 to actually resort to combat is far better than Majub's pitiful attacks that did nothing. For reliability, I'm easily put in Vegeta's Super Saiyan power at a low ball at Majub's power of 13 trillion, 810 billion, 243 million, 200,000 that of Kid Buu. And if Hellfighter 17 was able to fight even with base Vegeta, Previously, Hellfighter 17 is 50 times less than that 3 trillion mark, which would equal Vegeta's base, 276 billion, 204 million, 864,000 times that of Kid Buu. So now in the Super 17 arc, Vegeta has grown 2,639 times stronger. Very cool. That's a chaotic increase in probably less than one year. We don't have to theorize or make sense why. It just happens in GT. It's just a broken series. Now, if you think Vegeta's base power here is off the grid, just wait until you see Goku. What you must realize is that Super 17 goes through various power jumps through the fight, so I will be referring to the beginning Super 17 first, and then we will talk about end 17 during the fight with Super Saiyan 4 Goku later. Beginning Super 17 already proved he was above Majub's 13 trillion times Kid Buu power. For him to tank Majub's attacks with his back turned, not even feeling them, Super 17 is at least two times Majub at this point in order to tank it, making him approximately 27 trillion times that of Kid Buu. This is a criminal low ball. However, we will use it for now because this is beginning 17. He gets much stronger. Goku arrives on the battlefield and squares off against Super 17 as a Super Saiyan 1. Now, Super 17 is not as much as two times Super Saiyan 1 Goku because he could not tank the attacks of Super Saiyan Goku, but he is certainly more than equal, who can overwhelm Super Saiyan Goku as the fight goes on, making him at least 1.25 times stronger, a low domination multiplier. Early game, Goku did punch him in the guts, hurt Super 17 a bit and smashed him across the planet. For Super 17 to have a domination multiplier, 1.25 times is the highest we should go at this point in the fight, where he can't tank Super Saiyan Goku's raw strength, but enough to overwhelm him. If Super 17 is low ball to be 27 trillion, 620 billion, 486 million, 400,000 times that of Kid Buu, then Super Saiyan Goku is at 22 trillion, 96 billion, 389 million, 120,000 times that of Kid Buu, making his base form 441 billion, 927 million, 782,400 times that of Kid Buu. This would make Goku's base 5,776 times stronger than the Baby Saga, a monstrous power up. Goku decides to shape up and go straight to Super Saiyan 4. Now you can argue, with an extreme foundation of support in the battle, that if Goku just transformed into a Super Saiyan 2 or 3 and just pummeled the hell out of beginning Super 17 with his bare hands, he could probably have won through raw damage beatdown. However, Goku didn't have a clue what was going on. He did not know Super 17 was absorbing energy. He did not have any reason to believe an Android 17 model absorbs key due to his past knowledge of unlimited stamina, and he cannot sense Android energy so wouldn't know Super 17 is actually absorbing his own energy and becoming stronger without visually seeing it or getting beat up. Goku goes Super Saiyan 4 and tries to end it quick with key attacks. 
where Goku begins to think Super 17 is simply tanking them like a brute and Jess needs to hit him harder. So he goes with stronger key attacks, still getting nowhere, and it wasn't until Goku decided the hell with this, went for a 10 times Kamehameha to end it, and Super 17 absorbed that, confirming he was absorbing all along, not actually tanking the hits. Unfortunately for Goku, because he gambled and used that so-called strongest attack, it was too late for him. Super 17 absorbed the 10 times Kamehameha power of Super Saiyan 4, making it his own power, and he gets stronger than ever before. Want to know how much power he absorbed of Goku? Enough to actually overpower him and move faster, than Super Saiyan 4 in close combat. N17 is above Super Saiyan 4 Goku because he took the power of the 10 times Kamehameha and Goku was weakened after using that power. Super Saiyan 4 Goku's power is 2 septillion, 790 sextillion, 439 quintillion, 860 quadrillion, 64 trillion, 600 billion, 10 million, 342,400 times that of Kid Buu. Let's just say 2 septillion for ease. Then a 22 times boost for the 10 times Kamehameha raises Goku's power to 61 septillion. And if you combine that power with Super 17's original power of 27 trillion times that of Kid Buu, enough to give Android 17 and his unlimited stamina the edge over a weakened Super Saiyan 4 Goku. Super 17 has some insane feats of his own that Super Saiyan 4 Goku didn't even show. Not to worry though, Super Saiyan 4 Goku eventually surpasses Super 17 later down the line and would naturally inherit this power and speed to perform those feats anyway. But just what exactly are the feats of Super 17? Well, we all know the filler of the Dragon Ball Z anime counts in GT, and base Goku after the Cell games traveled a universe-sized realm in seconds with Pycon. This is quintillions the time the speed of light. Imagine how Super 17 compares to that speed. Look, why don't these characters use these feats in the story to make life easier? It's because the show still has a bloody story to tell, so there's character potential and then there's plot. Unfortunately, plot and narration overrides what characters should be able to do in combat. We have no control over the plot, but the feats in this continuity still stand for death battle purposes. Speed is ridiculous in GT. GT has some of the best speed perks ever. Super 17 has inaccessible speed, a tier above infinite speed. Infinite speed is moving an infinite distance within a finite amount of time, but inaccessible speed is moving any distance finite or infinite, within zero amount of time. Metacooler and Goku moved faster than instant transmission. Instant equals no time. Cooler and Goku move within no time. They have inaccessible speed in that continuity of Dragon Ball. The movies have more link to GT than they don't, and any inconsistencies are very minor. Super 17 is decillions faster than light, and with certain scales, he has inaccessible speed. The guy is so fast that even after Goku uses instant transmission, he can still hit Goku before before Goku can hit him due to being able to feel the vibrations in the air after the instant transmission resolves. In that small window, he can prevent an attack from someone who already uses a movement that gives an advantage. The universal or multiversal levels of power are consistent in GT, with the progression they are all growing. But now we move to the final part of this saga that completely breaks the universe, the Broken Dragon Fist. Now the Dragon Fist, it's the most broken move in Dragon Ball history that seemingly has no limits to its power or multiplier. Some think it's just a 10 times boost to Goku's power, but I'm about to show you why that's absurdly wrong. Super 17's body was essentially above Super Saiyan 4 Goku levels. Android 18 spams Key Blast at Super 17, causing him to absorb more power and leave himself open for an attack. But just because he's open for an attack doesn't guarantee attacks will actually hurt the powerhouse body of Super 17. Like I said, Majub attacked Super 17 like crazy. He was open for an attack there too, and that was before he absorbed more power. Now he's an even stronger body who opens himself up for an attack again. Even if Majub hit him here, would it do any better than before? No, it wouldn't, because he was open both times. Majub's attacks would once again bounce off his body as he's absorbing. He just doesn't have the raw power to budge Super 17's raw body. Which brings us to Goku, good old base Goku, who just blew himself up. States he doesn't have the energy to lift a finger. Essentially, you could say he's less than 10% power. Hell, you could even go as low as 1% power. He used up everything in the Kamehameha and the explosion, but then miraculously, he stands up and powers up a Dragon Fist. 
punching through Super 17 and then finishing him off with a base form Kamehameha. Now just think about the magnitude of raw power force here that is needed to beat Super 17. If Majub couldn't budge an open Super 17 at the start of the fight, somehow Goku's weakened base power with a Dragon Fist goes beyond everything in this fight and beats Super 17. What the hell happened there? You see, even if you apply a multiplier logic to the Dragon Fist, even if you wanted to give the Dragon Fist a 10 times boost, let's say Goku was down to 10% power, a 10 times multiplier would only make his base reach roughly that of his 100% base if that makes sense and that power as we know is far beneath Majub so the dragon fist at this stage cannot be quantified in terms of its multiplier of power the fact that it allowed a weakened base Goku to severely wound Super 17's raw body makes the dragon fist completely broken and could potentially have an infinite multiplier of power the dragon fist has never failed when going for a killing blow but it still overpowered Omega and would have killed him if it wasn't for regen so the Dragon Fist is a technique the GT Goku has at his disposal and can win any goddamn fight if it hits somebody, anybody who's stronger than him, it will beat them if they cannot regenerate. Power means nothing to the Dragon Fist. It makes its own rules of domination. It's a winning technique. But even if you wanted to give it a multiplier, because we all like numbers, because it actually penetrated Super 17, we could scale it to Super 17's power, and that would mean 10% base GT Goku needed a Dragon Fist multiplier boost of anything up to 1 quadrillion, 389 trillion, 133 billion, 685 million, 781,345 times. That's the multiplier Goku would need from 10% base form, or even more if you consider Goku below 10% power. That's so ridiculously stupid, but that's GT for you. And again, you can't use the Super 17 was open for an attack excuse, because like I said, he was open for an attack right at the beginning when he formed. Vegeta and Majub couldn't even make him flinch. That's how powerful base Goku is with the broken Dragon Fist. And what's even funny is that Goku still formed a Kamehameha after this to finish Super 17 off, showcasing absurdly broken stamina recovery levels. GT Goku's base power didn't get an overall permanent increase when he killed 17. It was just because of the Dragon Fist that allowed him that relentless short burst power. It was crystal clear that the Dragon Fist had no limits. The plot was telling us that as long as Goku could hit Super 17 with the Dragon Fist, it would work. And that's incredibly scary. To think GT Goku has this broken tool at his disposal, it doesn't matter who's stronger than him line them up because if they haven't got regen their hearts getting broken When Black Smoke Shenron arrives due to the negative energy buildup in the Dragon Balls, we get an idea of just how powerful these evil dragons are. It's stated by the Old Kai that these Shadow Dragons have what it takes to destroy the universe. Based on all previous feats and power in this series, that's no real surprise. But it's also consistent, as Mr. Popo further backs this up by stating, this happened a long time ago on another planet, and all of the cosmos outside the planet was destroyed. Read the definition on cosmos, it's everything. This should tell you just how far back the Dragon Ball lore goes. Who stopped these evil shadow dragons all those many years ago? Did they just wipe everything out and disappear? Job done? Are there different shadow dragons for each Dragon Balls? What other Dragon Balls were there on other planets? Who beat them and who restored everything? Such a mysterious backstory, answers we will never get the answers to. But let's jump back to the present. Yes, these shadow dragons are that serious. The old Kai is flipping out more than he ever has. You never see him this concerned. This is the biggest threat in existence. And now, let's find out just how strong each of these seven shadow dragons are, and how strong Goku gets. Hey Shenron is the first Shadow Dragon Goku and Pan encounter, but with him it's more about hacks than brute power. He is potentially the most dangerous character and could potentially solo a tournament of power. Before you know it, just being in this dragon's presence, you've already lost all your power. You have to end him quickly or know what's going on because if you don't know his ability, you may do the classic Dragon Ball trash talk scene and you've lost all your power before you know it. It's a terrible hack, spreading the poison minus energy throughout the opponent and battlefield. Luckily, Gil saves the two by cleansing them and then Goku and Pan end it quick. Power of this dragon is less than Pan, which is roughly rolled out to meta rolled out level, but his hacks are what's lethal. 
Raid Shenron is the Shadow Dragon most people ignore, and yet he's the most important to gauge in the rest of Goku's power. Rage grows stronger through electricity absorption. At one point, he uses Dragon Thunder on Super Saiyan 4 Goku, and it does nothing, but that was a bluff. All of a sudden, the dragon is literally tanking Super Saiyan 4 Goku's 10 times Kamehameha. He literally tanks it, catches it, holds it, launches it back at Goku, and smashes him out of Super Saiyan 4. He beats Super Saiyan 4 Goku. On a serious low ball, this dragon's power is equal to Super Saiyan 4 Goku power, but in order to toy with a 10 times Kamehameha, makes Raid Shenron's fast-growing power reach approximately 22 times to match the 10 times Kamehameha, and then a further times 2 to tank it, making him 44 times stronger than Super Saiyan 4 Goku and still rising. And then it gets worse. He absorbs more electricity. He grows to the size of a goddamn Dragon Zord and was literally about to kill Goku and Pan. The only reason he lost was because it rained. Yeah, think about that. It caused him to sizzle up and blow up from his own power. How much plot armor can you give someone to the point you write it to rain? This is a super important fight. This Shadow Dragon tops Goku's strongest power and lost through plot and was going to get even stronger before it rained. As we know, coming off the Super 17 Saga, Super Saiyan 4's power is 2 septillion, 790 sextillion, 439 quintillion, 860 quadrillion, 64 trillion, 600 billion, 10 million, 342,400 times that of Kid Buu's power. Making Raid Shenron's power 44 times of that, and that is 122 septillion, 779 sextillion, 353 quintillion, 842 quadrillion, 842 trillion, 400 billion, 455 million, 65,600 times that of Kid Boost power. Oceana Shenron. There's one thing it guarantees, and that's Pan's strength. For all of you that want to know just how strong Pan gets in Dragon Ball GT towards the end, this is the confirmation, and it's pretty damn high. This dragon is so powerful that the force it can generate with its own power by spinning extremely fast is enough to put Goku in danger to eventually get ragdolled to death. Base Goku is able to mimic the technique at the beginning and appear on par with Oceanus when they clash, but Oceanus turns it up to full power and Base Goku is unable to do anything against this power of the Force. Goku's Kamehameha is 2.2 times himself, and Oceanus' Wind Force technique can hit a power of at least 4.4 times base Goku due to tanking the Kamehameha. That is insane. You can argue it's wind pressure all you want, and that the dragon just spins really fast to form barriers and attacks but you cannot erase the fact that it is all the dragon's own force that generates the power. It is their power that generates the pressure at the end of the day, and it's getting the job done against Goku's power because he should be able to handle any form of wind pressure with his level of power, right? So it's the dragon's power that magnifies the force. You can argue it's mainly speed though, but if you know anything about power, power equals strength times speed. So the outcome is power regardless. Oceanus is not weak, far from it. The misconception is that they are actually really weak from above, but that's also incorrect. It's just from above, that's the only place Oceanus' technique wasn't aimed at. Not that they were weak from above or overall. This was the only place to attack Oceanus, and that's a nightmare if you think about it. This technique is extremely powerful, but Pan worked around that and Oceanus was screaming in pain from Pan's Kamehameha, where Goku was now free and adds his Kamehameha to steal Pan's thunder, where Pan had it all under control. That was her win and her gigantic plot-convenient power-up moment. It's easy to work out Oceanus' raw body power outside of the wind power. Goku performed a similar technique, cancelling out Oceanus' technique at the beginning and hit Oceanus clean. This surprised Oceanus, and it strengthens their raw body power and Goku's raw body power are similar when the techniques were cancelled out. But Pan's Kamehameha crippled Oceanus' raw body power without the wind power, causing Oceanus to scream in pain, making it reliable to say Pan's Kamehameha is bare minimum equal equal to Oceanus and base Goku's raw body power, or just a bit more, due to it being a clean, successful, effective hit, which Oceanus saw coming. And because they saw it coming, that negates the off-guard sucker punch sneak attack damage perks. If base Goku is equal to Oceanus at 441,927,782,400 times that of Kid Buu's power, then his Kamehameha would definitely overpower it with a direct hit. The Wind Force multiplier is at least 4.4 times, making it reach a power of 1.9 trillion times that of Kid Buu's power. Pan's Kamehameha is also 441 billion times that of Kid Buu, and if you divide that by 2.2 times to get her base power, it makes 
200,876,264,727 times that of Kid Buu's power. GT Pan, Solo Super Vegito in Dragon Ball Z Hell, Super Saiyan 3 Vegito, line them up. She falls shy of base Vegeta in the Super 17 arc, but she easily solos baby's last known parasite strength of 43 billion before he got launched into the sun. 200 billion Kid Buu. This is GT Pan's power. And she's always in base. Remember that. And it makes perfect sense at this point in the Dragon Ball GT Shadow Dragon adventure. It makes perfect sense why Pan is tagging along with Goku in the plot. And it makes sense that she's only 2.2 times weaker than his base form here. If she was nothing, if it was too dangerous for her, he would never let her come along. She wouldn't be written to be in the plot and could handle some of the early Shadow Dragons. In story, Goku can obviously sense she has dormant power that can handle herself in the early rounds. Hence why he only give her the warning when Nova Shenron turned up. The Shadow Dragons before that? Pan was valuable to the story and the fights. During the first four Shadow Dragons, Goku didn't carry Pan. Goku and Pan were a goddamn team. Like I said, it's only when Nova turned up that the threat level significantly increased. She grew to about half of base Goku's power for the convenience of the plot. And there's not a goddamn thing anybody can do about it. Natureon Shenron. This one is interesting. Natureon takes over bodies and uses them as a power source, but it's not necessarily the solo power of the absorbed being. It basically needs a vessel to unleash its own power of the Dragon Ball, plus whatever extras comes with a vessel. First, it's a mole body. There's no way Natureon can just use a mole's solo power to take on Goku and Pan. So we can say Natureon Shenron's bare minimum dragon power upon taking a powerless host gives him the power to hit Super Saiyan 4 Goku and Pan away with a shockwave. Therefore, Super Saiyan 4 Goku is not two times stronger as he's unable to remain still and tank the power clean. But Super Saiyan 4 Goku is definitely stronger than this dragon and can dominate it easily. Yes, really, really easy with no issue. So the high end of a domination multiplier is reliable at 1.75 times that of the dragon. Natron's power is approximately 1.5 septillion times that of Kid Buu. The dragon absorbs Pan and causes Goku trouble. His heart's just not in the fight. He doesn't want to kill Pan. The dragon has practically the same power as before. However, he tricks the dragon, rescues Pan, and blitzes the ugly base form of the dragon. Still a very powerful dragon that could solo baby Vegeta with ease. Roughly half the power of a Super Saiyan 4 Goku at this stage in the game is nothing to be ashamed of. Nova Shenron, here's where shit gets interesting. Goku and Pan encounter Nova, arguably the most popular Shadow Dragon. Pan gets overconfident and believes she can keep her and Goku's winning streak. But Goku specifically states that this Shadow Dragon is in a different class than the dragons they fought up until this point. Bear in mind, this is Nova's first form. Also bear in mind that Goku has no idea of further Nova transformations at this point. The power he is sensing is literally stated to be in a different class than the dragons before. And if you want to translate that to Dragon Ball slang, it means Nova is stronger than all other dragons so far. So what is the strongest Shadow Dragon we've encountered? Well, remember when I told you to remember Raid Shenron? Because when I constantly encourage people to actually watch the damn show and not trust a Reddit hate page, this is exactly why. Raid Shenron was the strongest Shadow Dragon up until this point. His power was clear to be roughly 122 septillion times that of Kid Buu. This immediately puts Nova at a low ball of 122 septillion times that of Kid Buu. Base Goku takes on this form of Nova. Take note that Base Goku could knock back Nova with a Kamehameha, dodge his attacks and force Nova to dodge, but Nova was still dominating and basically stalking Goku. So Nova is not two times base Goku, more like 1.25 times to still regain a domination multiplier. This means base Goku has increased in power to 98 septillion, 223 sextillion, 483 quintillion, 74 quadrillion, 273 trillion, 920 billion, 364 million, 52 2,480 times that of Kid Buu. I know that's the full number, but I'll only do it for Goku, for consistency purposes. It's the biggest broken power-up in Dragon Ball GT this far. His base form literally grew 222 trillion, 261 billion, 389 million, 724,915 times in one day. He is 35.2 times stronger than his Super Saiyan 4 self, against the other Shadow Dragons. This is what I'm talking about. GT Goku is goddamn broken potential, and this isn't even the end to it. You don't realize how broken this character is. People miss dialogue all the time and pretend it never happened. 
but it did happen. Nova transforms and so does Goku. Put in Super Saiyan 4 Goku at 620 under Cillian times that of Kid Buu. I know I said I'm going to pronounce the whole number for Goku, but forget that shit. It's getting absolutely ridiculous. The numbers cannot be fit onto the screen anymore. My calculator has literally been overwhelmed. Instead, I will keep it as simple as this. 620 under Cillian. And to make this as fair as possible, I will round down every answer I get to keep it neat because I'm not going to be funny at this stage in the game. It won't make that much of a difference. Dragon Ball GT officially broke Saiyan Scholar and my goddamn calculator. That's what the hell happened. Now it's stated Nova has the greatest speed advantage over Goku. He managed to beat Nova by outsmarting him. So we can only go with them being relative to each other. This makes Nova also 620 under Cillian times that of Kid Buu. Nova's transformation multiplier is a little less than Super Saiyan 4, but stands as a 5 trillion times multiplier. Ice Shenron shows up. Goku shoves a dragon fist down his throat. Ice is probably the hardest shadow dragon to gauge in terms of power because Super Saiyan 4 Goku literally demolishes him. But his abilities do initially stop Super Saiyan 4 Goku from moving. Ice is not as powerful as Nova, as Goku handled Ice with less difficulty, but Nova does show fear when it comes to Ice due to him being his brother. Maybe he's Nova's Achilles heel and Ice has the abilities that are super effective against Nova, but it makes no sense because Nova is a fire type Pokemon and Ice is, you get it, it's GT and it makes no sense. Ice is irrelevant right now, but it's possible he's somewhere in between Rage Shenron and Nova Shenron. It's a pretty monstrous power. Combined with his sneaky style, he's actually the most horrible Shadow Dragon to fight in my opinion. Now we get to the main event of Dragon Ball GT, Sin Shenron. The one-star dragon finally shows his face after walking across the planet in slow motion for a few days. So where's his power at? Well, he kills Nova in one blast. Call it a sneak attack, I suppose. But the most accurate display of Sin's power is when Super Saiyan 4 Goku charges up a 10 times Kamehameha and blasts it at Sin, point blank in the face, and Sin laughs it off. Okay, so Goku's 10 times Kamehameha makes his power skyrocket to 13 duo decillion times stronger than that of Kid Buu. Think about that for a moment. I wonder if Cauliflower is this much stronger than Kid Buu. Anyway, Sin tanks it, making him at least two times stronger than that. 27 duo decillion times stronger than Kid Buu. Jesus Christ. This is what you wanted, ultra full power Saiyan 4. Finally, after Sin squashes Super Saiyan 4 Goku, the rest of the warriors show up to help Goku fight against Sin Shenron. Trunks, Gohan, Goten help Goku reach a new level of power, performing a similar ritual as they did when Goku fought Baby, only this time they give all their power to Goku. Now, I don't have to remind you of how much stronger Goku's base form is right now far above Baby Saga levels. So in order for Super Saiyan Trunks, Super Saiyan Gohan, Super Saiyan Goten to refuel Goku's base body and then give him even more than his current base power must mean Super Saiyan Goten, Trunks and Gohan's combined power in Super Saiyan is at least the level of base Goku, which if you think about it, that's a pretty monstrous power up for those three. We'll calculate their plot convenient power ups after this. So how the hell does Ultra Full Power Saiyan 4 work? There are so many questions regarding this level of Super Saiyan 4. Does Goku's base just grow past its previous limit so Super Saiyan 4 is naturally stronger when the multiplier is added? Or does Goku reach a new level of Super Saiyan 4, similar to Super Saiyan grades? The transformation itself does indeed imply something is different in Goku, like he's a turbocharged Super Saiyan 4, but it could also be for cinematic purposes. But it's clear he's still just a Super Saiyan 4, just insanely stronger. The power-up scene in itself is interesting. Goku, while still in base form, is stated to be at full power by Gohan and the others. Now, it must be noted, they give all of their power to Goku and he's still in base form, and then he transforms. So it's clear they strengthened his base form first to new levels, thus making ultra full power Saiyan 4, still just 100% Super Saiyan, but a much stronger Goku. How much stronger did Goku get? Well, Super Saiyan 4 Goku is able to dominate Sin Shenron. He dodges Sin like crazy, blocks him, and is able to completely overpower him. However, Goku cannot fully tank Sin, so he's not two times stronger, but he's got a very high domination multiplier. So 1.75 times Sin's power is a reliable number to use for Goku's new level of power. Ultra Full Power Saiyan 4 is 47 duo decillion times stronger than Kid Buu. This means Goku's base form became 77 times stronger from the ritual, making Goku's base form now at 7 octillion times that of Kid Buu. It's goddamn crazy. So yes, Ultra Full Power Saiyan 4 is 77 times that than the Super Saiyan 4 that previously fought Sin.
Let's talk about the real power of Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. As we all know, Super Saiyan Gohan, Trunks, and Goten gave all their power to Goku. He was fully drained out. He couldn't even go Super Saiyan. Somehow, these three received a massive plot convenient power-up in order to be relevant in the Shadow Dragon's arc. And this is simple to calculate. Goku's new base form is 7 octillion times that of Kid Buu. Now, we could increase Gohan, Goten, and Trunks' power in a linear fashion from the Baby Saga, but the truth is, we don't know how much stronger they got individually. All we know is that the three of them were strong enough to fill up Goku's key with raw Super Saiyan power. Not Genki, not like a spirit bomb, it's different. This isn't life energy or anything like that. They actually transferred their raw power to Goku through powering up. So it's a straight up swap of their actual power. The three of them filled it up and based on all three of them performing and appearing roughly the same level of strength in this saga, it's more reliable to say the three are roughly equal and make up a third of the power each. Like I said, we could go with a linear increase in the baby saga if you think that's the way to go but it doesn't make any real difference in the grand scale of things, pun intended. But I think it's reliable to go with what we see here, and that's the three of them combined equal 7 octillion times that of Super Saiyan 3 versus Kid Buu. Split that into three, and we get each of them as Super Saiyan at 2.3 octillion times that of Super Saiyan 3 Goku versus Kid Buu. Divide it by 50 for their base form, and we get each of them at 466 septillion times that of our great landmark Kid Buu versus Super Saiyan 3 Goku. Let me tell you what this means. These three in base form could crap on the entire Super 17 saga and the entire baby saga in base form alone. Super Saiyan 4 Goku back then, Super 17, Baby Vegeta, base trunks, now solos, all of them, all at the same time. And that's why GT has plot convenient power-ups that your favorite franchises could only dream of. In fact, these are nightmares. And what about Majub? Well, at this stage, who gives a damn? We can only put him at the level he was before because there's no proof he got any stronger. No plot convenient power-up like the others. He was begging to fuse with Gohan, Trunks, and Goten in order to get stronger. That should sadly tell you how left behind Maju became. To the point where he was just fodder for Sin Shenron and didn't even contribute to Goku powering up. Sad. Anyhow, moving on. It's interesting to note, Omega Shenron states he's 10 times stronger than before, perhaps even more. So this is simple, we just keep it at 10 times and have him at 272 duo decillion times stronger than Kid Buu. He is able to body ultra full power Saiyan 4 to no surprise. He is about 5.78 times stronger than Goku at this point, when we consider the exact calculations I have. But 5 to 6 times makes it easier for you to understand. However, it's important to note, Goku has an insane ability, it's a hack. You see, despite Omega's clear raw power advantage, he uses the absorbed dragon's techniques on Goku. Dragon Thunder, all that craziness. Goku is not hurt by it. He explains that once that ability has been used on him, it doesn't work again. This is proven in his fight with Ice Shenron. When Ice went to freeze him again, Goku's body instantly reacted and put up a shield barrier to protect itself, without Goku even doing anything by command. This is literally what Ultra Instinct is by concept, except it actually cancels out the opponent's abilities completely. So yes, this is a hack Super Saiyan 4 Goku has, and another one that many just ignore. To be honest, maybe even base Goku has it because he mentioned the same thing to Frieza and Cell when he whipped their candy asses in hell. Very powerful feat where stronger abilities don't even hurt him. So the only way to beat him is literally beat the monkey's ass with stronger raw attacks in hoping he doesn't get a Zenkai boost later on. So Goku manages to land the Dragon Fist on Omega Shenron, penetrated him, and would have killed him if it wasn't for regen. Again, as explained in the last episode, the Dragon Fist is broken. It breaks all rules of power. It's a winning technique unless the enemy has regen. Very dangerous for anyone fighting the Super Saiyan 4 Goku, but we did calculate the power up to it in the last episode and that was approximately one quadrillion on top of the form it's being used in. I'm going to address the infamous and probably the most lied about crisis in GT history, the good old Super Saiyan 4 glass cut. Believe it or not, there are some people out there that don't understand this and legitimately use it as proof of Super Saiyan 4's power, immediately making Raditz or even Yajirobe stronger. Yes, that's what they believe. And if they don't believe it, they play this card to crack a joke when their actual Dragon Ball knowledge is backed into a corner. What they don't realize is the narrative purpose of this scene. So taking you back, Goku had the crap beat out of him all day by the remaining Shadow Dragons. 
Goku was on the bare bones of his ass, and Omega pummeled him even more. The glass cut on Goku's beaten ass was a dramatic cinematic moment to emphasize he's destroyed from all the fighting, he is digging deep, like Rocky. If you want to take this moment seriously in regards to power, ignoring everything else that's gone on in GT, what you should actually be is actually impressed by this glass cut from a technical standpoint. Think about it. Let's say Raditz is at 1200 power. He wouldn't get hurt by glass. Then how weakened, beat up, unsteady on his key must Goku have been for glass to actually hurt his body? Yet he was still maintaining Super Saiyan 4 and still in the fight against GT's final boss. Think about it. GT Goku is so goddamn raw and that much of a master of ki and stamina and everything that he still held on to Super Saiyan 4 whilst being beat down to as weak as glass level for that moment. That's incredible. So next time you bring up Super Saiyan 4 is glass level to mock it, just remember you're actually praising it when you use the full context of the moment, which I doubt you do. Characters in Z and Super get hit into rocks all the time and they get scuffs and marks from the rocks grinding against their body and face. Does that make God's pebble level now? Goku gets marked by a bullet, but does that mean he's back to bullet level? Nah, he's heavily suppressed, right? That's okay because Super Goku gets a free pass on those things. He's allowed to be suppressed, but Super Saiyan 4 Goku? beaten and broken from actually fighting. He's not allowed one moment of weakness where his energy's been hindered from being broken and beaten. No, no, rejected, it's GT. But it always seems to be the super fanboys who bring up these bollocks arguments and haven't got a leg to stand on when you turn the tables with credible examples. The double standards in this community, I tell you. Next time you wanna laugh and misunderstand the glass cut scenario, always let it be a reminder of what GT does that Super Nintendo don't. Blood. Next up is probably the second biggest, lamest, misunderstood argument I've seen in the community. The mockery of GT Goku struggling to push a skyscraper building. This is a skyscraper that can be easily in the 200,000 ton range based on an average skyscraper being around that, without interior contents or persons. And they think it's Super Saiyan 4's maximum lifting strength, despite in one minute later lifting half of the goddamn city from underneath. Half of a city, and most of the earth underneath the city. Do you know the weight of that? Do you know how dense all that is? Yes, this one is great fun. I mean, struggling is the most inaccurate word they use. The truth is, the struggle was not the lift, but the worry of not killing everybody inside the building by pushing it too hard. I mean, first of all, name me a greater lifting feat of just pure lifting strength in the entirety of the Dragon Ball franchise. Go on, I'll wait. Oh, hold on. Metal Man, right? 1,000 or so tons. Post Battle of Gods, mind you, and Vegeta broke his goddamn back. How about Yardrat Vegeta deflecting an approximate 5,000 ton building? Where Vegeta was stronger than the Zarbon wannabe anyway, so could obviously lift it. A building that barely looks one story of that entire skyscraper building that GT Goku pushed whilst in midair and nothing to push off as compared to being on the ground like Vegeta. That doesn't weigh up in the slightest to GT. The best thing about the skyscraper building is that if you actually watch the full episode, and I know that's a struggle for you, instead of some dumb YouTube clip that's cut down, then base GT Goku actually catches the building, yes, in base form, and pushes it, yes, in base, whilst in the air with his tiny arms for a moment, where you see it swaying up and down, clearly showing you the base Goku held it and pushed it. He didn't even break the goddamn glass when pushing that building. You were right, guys. He definitely isn't glass level. Or maybe glass in GT is god tier, because that point of glass being pushed took the weight of the whole goddamn skyscraper. Or maybe it's Goku's amazing key control. He's such a master of key control, he didn't even crack the glass whilst pushing a 200,000 ton skyscraper. Think about that key control. It's the key control Super Saiyan Blue only dreams of. Throw a 50 times multiplier on it for Super Saiyan. It's a linear increase in strength, and these chumps think Super Saiyan 4, that's his maximum lifting strength. It's great, isn't it? So there you can see the lie straight away from those that didn't watch it properly. 200,000 tons is far above Metal Man and the one-story building on Yajirat. Even if you want to go with a lifting strength comparison, base GT Goku did in fact push it, so at bare minimum, 
it's 40 times more impressive than Yardrat Base Vegeta dealing with that building being thrown at him. Go figure. Next, do you even know why it swayed the skyscraper? Do you even know the point of the episode in that scene? Let me tell you because you obviously skipped the majority of GT. That scene was about Goku and Pan acting as heroes to save the city whilst the evil dragon was trying to destroy it. They were doing superhero shit in a superhero sketch. Saving the people, like Superman does. The building was swaying and Goku was being extremely careful not to kill everyone inside by a collapsing building if he pushed it forward too far. He was trying to be steady and place it back to its normal position. That's actually extremely good key control if you think about it. Imagine Goku used his max strength and pushed that building and killed everyone. What sort of writing is that? Goku went Super Saiyan 4 for two reasons. Firstly, in the way he transformed, looking cool in the window in front of all the screaming people with his aura lit, it was for the cool factor. He looked cool. A dramatic effect that this is your hero. This is GT's hero. And the writers can show everybody this is Super Saiyan 4, the flagship of GT. He's saving everybody. Yay! That's why they didn't make him go Super Saiyan 1, 2, 3, whatever. Writers wanted that Super Saiyan 4 for a cinematic reason, and it did its part. Secondly, the most important reason why he went Super Saiyan 4? Key control, stability if you want to be technical, to be as safe as possible to place the building down to a secure position, save everyone's goddamn life. Super Saiyan 4 is the most ideal form to be in action with. It's Goku's most balanced form. It's so efficient in key control, stamina, strength. Why would he use Super Saiyan 1, 2, 3 with his tiny body when he could just become Super Saiyan 4, a full-fledged adult with ultimate power and save all the people efficiently without taking any risks whilst acting as a hero, which was the direction of the scene. But you missed that, didn't you? The Reddit hate page is enough for you. Lifting feats have always been inconsistent and draggable anyway. The Rock as a child the 40 ton weights in other world so even at a stretch why would you use such a ridiculous superhero sketch scene in terms of actual combat scenarios because you're desperate that's why and if you actually paid attention to it properly like him lifting the goddamn city from underneath then it's actually more of an impressive lifting feat than you thought possible but you didn't tell it right did you no you lied once again. Even if you wanted to get technical, whatever multiplier you want to give to Super Saiyan 4 because the forms are a set increase of strength, then he's lifting that many more skyscrapers, at least in terms of what we saw base Goku push here for a moment. You must be so desperate for points against GT. Did Dragon Ball Super damage you that much? Go and watch your precious Dragon Ball Super and bring me the best lifting or pushing feats in terms of raw lifting strength. You'll probably start highballing the Metal Man to 1 billion tons or something shit like that. Well, they said he's over 1,000 tons. That must mean 17 quadrillion tons. Not close to 1,000. Super fanboys, I tell you. Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta is a confusing one, frustratingly, and causes an ultra full power headache. Many don't realize this, but Bulma only helped Vegeta become a regular Uzaru. Vegeta went Golden Ape and Super Saiyan 4 all by himself. In the GT Perfect Files, it states Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta's power should be relative to Super Saiyan 4 Goku's power. Is this inconsistent in the actual show? Goku has grown ridiculous amounts as an ultra full power Saiyan 4, right? And yet, Vegeta struggles to keep up with Nova Shenron after he's reborn, relative to the previous Goku that fought Nova. Now, either Vegeta did match Goku's new Super Saiyan 4 power, and Nova, once reborn, gained a serious power-up, or Vegeta is far weaker than Goku when both are at full power, and I'm talking approximately 77 times weaker than Goku, because that's the power of Goku got in ultra full power. Think about this, these two perform similar against Omega Shenron, and a similar power is needed for a fusion dance to work. By concept, they have to be equal. Or we can use head cannon to say Goku lowers his power to match Vegeta, which is never stated. Or we can use the plot and say Goku's power was weakening, so it naturally went down to Vegeta's levels. That one seems very thin though, because Goku's weakened power wasn't stated until sometime after Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta. Even after they defused, Omega kept trying to stop them fusing, 
because he still found Goku's power a threat. It wasn't until many failed attempts and beatdowns that Omega then realized Goku's lost all his power to sustain fusion. So it was always implied Goku and Vegeta were level before going into the first fusion dance and even trying it a second time. But it was after that he started to weaken fast. So yes, this one is a goddamn headache as you can tell to work out Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta. So the way I'm going to do this and make it work is bringing Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta's power equal to Goku's in a massively insane plot convenient boost in order for fusion to work and to go hand in hand with the GT Perfect Files. The Nova Shenron vs Vegeta moment we can simply conclude he outclassed Vegeta due to his insane speed and a crazy plot power up if you want to after being reborn. But we never do see Goku outclass Nova's max speed so that still holds weight as to why Vegeta couldn't keep up with him. Goku won by outsmarting Nova. That's nothing to do with physical speed. And plus, Vegeta does use the Ultra Brutes Waves emitter, so that makes sense. It would make sense he's Ultra too, right? And this makes Vegeta's new base form at 7 octillion times that of Kid Buu along with Goku, making Vegeta's base 25 quadrillion times stronger than he was in the Super 17 saga. And his Super Saiyan 4 form relative to Goku is at 47 duo decillion times stronger than Kid Buu. Still not enough to beat Omega separately, but there is one who can do that. The strongest fusion character in Dragon Ball history. Or is he? Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, let's get straight to business. Fusion multiplier law is so inconsistent and we need to stick with one. So I'll do my best in explaining what fusion multiplier I chose for this because we are all going to be different guys. So let's break down some of the source material and stick to our guns here. Firstly, A times B from the super exciting guide, no other material supports this and it's broken. It's not a set fusion amp. The fusion multiplier itself widens the stronger the fighters are. So I'm not using this one. Next, we have the GT Perfect file stating Gogeta Super Saiyan 4 is dozens stronger than a regular Super Saiyan form. I spoke to Herms98 who translated it and it literally does translate to several tens stronger than an individual Super Saiyan 4 when reading across from the page with Super Saiyan 4 Goku and Vegeta there. Several tens stronger is also backed up in the Dragon Ball Z Son Goku Densetsu where it used a similar dozen stronger when referring to Gotenks. I would like to use what Vado said in Dragon Ball Super for the Potara, the sum of the parts then multiply tens of times. Tens of times still shares some relevance to dozens and the GT Perfect Files several tens stronger. But again, this is Potara and it's a modern Dragon Ball statement that Vado speaks. Back then in the 90s, Potaro was stated to clearly be stronger than Fusion Dance, both in the show and the Daisenshu. Base Vegito could take on Buhan, but Super Saiyan 3 Goku couldn't. So Potara is at least a 400 times amp just by going with that mindset. And that is far more than dozens or several tens that's being referred to for fusion dance. Potara fusion is hundreds if not thousands above Goku or Vegeta's base power alone. Gogeta in the Broly movie states the two powers aren't just added together, they're significantly magnified as well. And that's for the fusion dance. The truth about this guys is there is no truth. It's all inconsistent. This is a never-ending debate. You literally go around in circles and you basically just have to choose one, explain it and be reasonable with what tens or dozens mean. Some love to go high balls and low balls, but I feel a mid ground is the best here because it's rare we get to see full power of fusion anyway. So I'm not going with A times B. Like I said, that's inconsistent in itself. So for fusion, I tend to go with a plus B, some of the parts, and then multiply that by 100. That way it's not hundreds, it sits reasonably as tens and can be classified as that, but also low balls and rounds down the dozens term too. As you know, a gross is 144, and gross is used after dozen. 12 dozens is a gross, so bringing a gross down a few dozens and a little bit more to round it to 100 is not an unreasonable multiplier either. But what do I mean by A plus B? Well, A plus B base forms then times 100. In Vegito's case, that would never match Buhan. That would literally result in a power equal to Super Saiyan 2 Goku or Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta alone. And we know base Vegeta was far above that level. So A plus B, I refer to as the strongest parts of both warriors, add their best power, then times 100. So for Vegito and Z, it's Super Saiyan 3 Goku plus Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta, then times 100 equals base Vegito's power. So essentially base Vegito is over 100 Super Saiyan 3 Gokus. You can't really knock that. I mean, Boo Tanks was wasting Super Saiyan 3 Goku and then went a tier above again after absorbing Gohan. Base Vegito is far above Super Saiyan 3 Goku. 
base go tanks can be considered a hundred Super Saiyan Trunks and Super Saiyan Gotens punching you in the face at the same time. Base Kefla is Super Saiyan 2 Cauliflower plus controlled Berserk Kale, then times a hundred, you get the idea. I hope I sound reasonable here, I try and explain this as best as I can, considering the ridiculous vague statements of fusion and all the contradictions. So base Gogeta is basically Super Saiyan 4 Goku plus Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta times 100. And that's how to keep it simple. But you apply whatever multiplier you want to these two and let me know what you think it should be. But I'll go with this. Super Saiyan 4 Goku at 47 Duo Decillion and Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta's 47 Duo Decillion equals 94 Duo Decillion then times 100, we get 9 Tree Decillion, 399 Duo Decillion for Base Gogeta. That's insane. That puts Base Gogeta at 34.44 times stronger than Omega Shenron. But what about Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta? Let's add the Super Saiyan 4 multiplier on top. The good old 6 trillion multiplier. We get Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta at 59. Okay. Sep 10 decillion, 353 sex decillion times, right, that's enough. Stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku versus Kid Buu's power. Gigantic. Plot has Omega Shenron survive the Big Bang Kamehameha, where he loses all of the Dragon Balls. If Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta was stated to be able to defeat Omega with one finger, there's no reason statistically and through scaling why Omega could survive a Big Bang Kamehameha. Even just a normal Ki Blast, except for plot allowing him to. Yes, yes, plot and story typically interfere with what fighters can do in Dragon Ball. So we have to know when to separate feats and potential from storytelling. Eat your heart out, Cauliflower. Now, before we get to the real power of the change state, let's break down the most downplayed and criminally lowballed feat in Dragon Ball history, Omega Shenron's Minus Energy Universal Destruction feat. This happened right after Goku had fallen from the Minus Ball. The reason why this feat is downplayed is because the Minus power was destroying the universe over time and not instantly at the click of their fingers. That is literally it. But then, the ones who downplay this feat will stop right there and aren't able to expand on what is actually happening with the feat, the truth. So let me explain to you so you know just how deadly this feat is and what it means about Omega Shenron's raw power in general when he actually tries. As you know, major fighters in the GT universe have been in the multiversal range in terms of raw power scaling ever since Super Saiyan 1 Goku at the beginning of GT. If you don't agree with that, definitely check out episode 1 and 2 and it will quickly answer your questions on that. So there's no surprise, maximum potential fighters in the Shadow Dragons arc are in a higher multiversal raw power potential range. Look, even on the official Toei website, Black Smoke Shenron, the blue asshole dragon with a cigar, even he is universal as it's stated he will destroy the whole universe if left alone. You can interpret that however you want, but it's simple to understand. Black Smoke Shenron can destroy a universe. Omega Shenron's minus energy feat affects everything in the universe, significantly affecting. So it's at least universal plus. It significantly affects the living world, other world, hell, and even the Kaioshin realm. We all know where the Kaioshin realm is located in terms of the universe. Omega states he will lay waste to the entire universe, and this is not a lie. This isn't instant, but it's happening very quickly as Kabito Kai wants to leave immediately. I mean, where is he planning on going? Universe 6? So the feat is not insta-universe destruction, right? Yet it's happening very quickly, and yet some people don't even realize the truth here, that Omega is not fighting to create this feat. He's not creating huge energy balls to create this feat. He's not clashing punches with gods of destructions to create this feat. He's not even powering up excessively to create this feat. Omega is standing still, creating this feat, laughing. Omega is merely existing and the universe is being destroyed. Think about that. How can standing still be the full capabilities of a character? It's factually and statistically not true. If his presence is destroying the universe very quickly, regardless of plot and storytelling, what do you think his explosive power potential can do? If he can just stand there and destroy the universe, it's frightening. And this is why the scaling and this power scale is extremely consistent and reliable to put these characters multiversal due to the power jumps from the beginning of GT. His energy was stretching across the entire macrocosm, and we know his energy was distorting spatio-temporality. 
since it states that his energy was going to destroy the entire universe, the universe is not defined by its size, but the combination of spatio and temporal dimensions, or time and space together in layman's terms. So if Omega Shenron was going to destroy the entire universe, then his energy affects it on a space level as well as time. His energy even seems to reach outside the macrocosm, in turn meaning his negative energy from merely existing can reach past infinity since the universe is infinite. The reason why the feat in itself isn't multi multiversal because he needs to destroy 1001 different space-time continuums. That many space-times doesn't exist inside the macrocosm even including the Kaioshin realm. However, with the raw power increase of the GT verse since Kid Buu and the feats that appeared in the Z anime, Omega Shenron is capable of duo decillions the power of Kid Buu, which is far greater than 1001. So this is a fair analysis. The feat is a multiversal, but the power potential of Omega Shenron is high levels of multiversal. I mean, a universal plus feat from standing still. Standing still! <laughs> <laughs> but you can push it to low multiversal in itself if you wanted to. And that's a power of his at the very least. Not the very most, because standing still is when fighters do their absolute least in performance. Put that in your pipe and smoke it whilst you're around the campfire with GTs, gods of destruction. Omega Shenron and Lord Lude. Let's reveal why it could very well be a 5D feat if we do consider the movieverse to be linked to Dragon Ball GT. So, Omega was destroying the macrocosm by just existing and standing still. And this would include the dead zone, which is confirmed to be a hyperspace, making this feat 5D. As a hyperspace has four or more spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension, so length, width, depth, time, and a one or more unknown extra spatial dimension. And to make it make sense, Garlic Jr. only created a portal to the dead zone, not the dimension, but Omega was still going to destroy it by existing, along with the rest of the macrocosm. So Omega can destroy a hyperspace, making him 5D. So this in turn could very well make Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta 5D, change state Goku 5D, and at a push, Ultra Super Saiyan 4 Goku with his Dragon Fist power, because he did display as much power to overpower Omega at one point, penetrating him and almost beating him, where only Regen saved him. Let's begin where Goku and Vegeta lose their Super Saiyan 4 power from being too exhausted. They're beat down and pretty much on the ropes. Omega Shenron charges up his minus ball once again and plans to end it all. He launches an attack. Vegeta steps into counter, but Goku smashes Vegeta out of the way and intends on taking the hit himself. Keep in mind, this is a Goku who has been fighting all day and now lost his power to transform. He can't even fuse. He's absolutely ruined at this point. This is until the minus energy ball makes contact with him. Omega implies the energy ball is smaller than before, so we won't give it a 12.4 times multiplier like it was against Gogeta, but rather half of it due to it being roughly half the size, so 6.2 times the power boost, making this attack approximately 1.6 tridecillion times that of Kid Buu. Goku blocks this attack, a Goku who literally just seemingly lost all of his strength, but with his heart and courage he blocks the attack and he pushes it back towards Omega, igniting his aura. Even Omega screams at one point. He blocked this attack for nearly a minute. Omega powers up and pushes even harder to finally annihilate Goku. Now, Domination Multiplier, yes, Omega's attack was stronger at this point, but for Goku to block and hold it for nearly a minute doesn't mean he was absolutely insanely dominated. The ball eventually hit him, so given this minus ball a low-end Domination Multiplier of 1.25 times this monstrous overflowing power of Goku is reasonable due to Goku's sheer will, love for the Earth, and his courage raising his power to initially take on the minus ball to a degree. As we know, courage is a part of key. Courage is the theme of the 4-star ball, the GT special. It's perfectly reasonable for base Goku's power to skyrocket here based on his courage raising his key to new heights. This could very well be what activates the change state. Courage. That's just a thought. Now if Goku managed to push away this energy ball, we don't know how he would have performed against Omega in close combat with that height and strength displayed. But if he's able to nearly deal with a minus ball, that is 6.2 times Omega's power for nearly a minute, 
it's now statistically possible he could deal with Omega's regular power if he could sustain the same willpower he displayed against the Minus Ball. This is absolutely insane when you think about it, and if you think it's ridiculous and shouldn't be this way, remember the entire GT series so far, this is consistent with the ridiculous jumps in GT. It's true. It truly is all about Goku's broken power-ups to fit the rhythm of the plot. Remember, when Goku was weakened in base form, couldn't lift a finger, and then beat Super 17 just like that, a Super 17 who was above Super Saiyan 4 Goku's 10 times Kamehameha power? Remember how Goku's base went to Super Saiyan 4 levels over the course of a few days in between Nature and Shenron and Nova Shenron? The base jump against the Minus Ball follows the same broken power jump consistency. At this point in the struggle, the change state of Goku is not fully active. But a change does indeed start happening over Goku, at least in power. Goku's power at this point is 1.3 tree decillion times that of Kid Buu for being able to handle the minus ball for that amount of time. It's far more likely that the power increases down to the change state kicking in, almost like Ultra Instinct Sign. This is the sign version of Goku's change state. Now the change state is by far the most powerful transformation Goku has ever utilized, and I have a solid foundation of evidence in this video that it's the strongest form of Goku in every single Dragon Ball continuity. The change state form's potential is boundless. But what exactly is it? Why is this form criminally under-talked about in the community? Well, first of all, we know the majority of Dragon Ball GT haters breeze through GT at best without paying any actual attention to what's going on. Maybe a few dub YouTube clips and a dozen Reddit hate pages to strengthen their lack of knowledge of GT. So let's begin with credible material. First, let's begin with an official interview in the 2005's Dragon Ball GT Dragon Box DVD release. Script writer Atsushi Mikawa details on Goku's change state. To be honest, in GT episode 63, just before the final episode, a big change comes over Goku. Those who watched carefully might have noticed, but in that episode, Goku, who takes on Yi Xinglong's attack, sinks to the bottom of a deep hole. That is the turning point. Afterward, Goku still continues the battle. But what's different from before is that he's cloaked in an aura that won't let any attacks near him. It might be that he died there. Or it might be that he became something else entirely. I'll leave that decision up to the imaginations of everyone who watched. However, the Goku up to that point that everyone knows clearly does not appear after that. In the world of Dragon Ball, Goku had already died multiple times, and up till then, each time he appeared with a halo over his head. However, I didn't want to go with the usual concept of even when he dies, he comes right back to life. I wanted the viewers to picture death in that way, and a feel of sadness close to it in reality, so I had a change come over Goku. Now, just so you know, this video's intention is not explaining the mystery behind what's going on, but only explain the power displayed in front of us. In a nutshell, after Goku falls to the minus ball, a change has fully come over him when he's rising with the spirit bomb, and he is much, much stronger, to the point where it's uncertain of his actual limits. The narrative uses Pan to explain Goku is a god. And in Dragon Ball GT, or at least during that time in Dragon Ball, the level Goku ascended to was the highest in terms of pure light celestial energy, the complete opposite of minus energy. You could even say in the GT verse, Goku is angelic, a height beyond anything in Dragon Ball at that time that no one else could reach, where he can travel to places no one else can go. This was higher than every single Kaioshin rank at the time. It was never stated what he became, but the story clearly shows us that he had become the peak of Dragon Ball power. How strong is this form? Well, before Goku fell to the Minus Ball, which had a power of 1.6 tree decillion times that of Kid Buu, we calculated Goku's power to be 1.3 tree decillion times Kid Buu. The change was starting to take effect there. However, when Goku is holding the Spirit Bomb, he is tanking Omega's attacks like they are nothing. What begins with Omega launching a barrage of key attacks at Goku, Goku endures the impact as he's communicating with King Kai, then all of a sudden, it escalates and Omega launches his Minus Ball at Goku. And after a direct hit. Goku took it on the chin and is just there smiling away like nothing happened. Absolutely insane. This shows us that Goku's power was gradually rising in this changed state, where it became its fullest potential. It's crystal clear he completely changes once the white glow fully surrounds his body towards the finale where he launches the spirit bomb. The changed state at this point easily puts Goku above the minus energy ball. In fact, it's far in the clear. Even if we lowballed it to times 2 the minus energy ball, that means Goku is 2 times the 6.2 multiplier, making him a bare minimum of 12.4 times Omega Shenron's raw base power. 
Now the fact that the minus ball hit Goku in the face and he remained there floating, didn't even budge an inch, didn't even flinch, is two times the minus ball, a criminal level low ball. The fact that Goku was taking zero damage from these attacks, the fact he appeared indestructible, makes the change state at levels we can't even fathom or quantify. We just don't know how far it pushes Goku's potential. There were no limits from what we saw, but we have to go with a two times the minus ball for fairness here, as it helps with the consistency for domination multipliers and growth in this power scale. But there is a strong possibility the change state has an infinite multiplier, at least in terms of durability, making Goku ascend to a level nobody can hurt. So 3.2, 3 decillion times stronger than Kid Buu for the change state, but what would the multiplier of the change state be? So if Goku was less than 10% power during the minus ball struggle, that would make weakened base Goku roughly 700 septillion times Kid Buu instead of a full base of 7 octillion times Kid Buu. In order to get to 2 times the minus ball, it's about a 4.5 quadrillion multiplier. What the hell? But if we use a theoretical 100% full base Goku, then his change form would take him to near 32 tree decillion times Kid Buu's power. Yes, change Goku is literally the god of Dragon Ball, at least classic Dragon Ball. 32 tree decillion times Kid Buu. I mean, we only grounded it so that we can put a number on it in the first place. It likely has no limit. Or at the very least, we didn't come close to nailing the rest of the power increase. He could be two times stronger than the minus ball, ten times, a thousand, one million, one billion. We don't know. Even if you don't want to use a multiplier, it already showcases indestructible durability feats against raw power that's multiversal from scaling. Omega Shenron dies due to the beautiful spirit bomb, which let's be honest, it's a fantastic send-off attack to tell a wonderful story. Why did Goku urgently request power for the spirit bomb to defeat Omega if his body was able to tank Omega's best hits? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. This is where you must know the difference between statistical potential versus storytelling. The truth behind the stats is that Goku could ruin Omega Shenron with his bare hands at this point. Potential-wise due to his ability and performance, but story-wise... They wanted the spirit bomb to be the ultimate finish. The desperation that this is the only way. And why wouldn't you want that? It's an amazing story. We must accept plot and narrative overrides the real use of characters' potential and what they're visually portraying on screen. We must accept they wanted a grand finish pun intended, with Goku's ultimate move. Positive versus minus energy. Got to make it dramatic with the urgency. But the script doesn't change Goku's power and how he tanked Omega Shenron. We have to deal with GT's lack of logic and sense. And believe me, there is plenty of it. But after the fight, Goku is KO'd. Visually, it appears like Shenron heals and exhausted Goku from the battle. But what's important to note is that the battle did indeed have a major toll on Goku. The battle completely whipped his base form ass in terms of exhaustion. A change state would obviously be dangerous on a base form of 10% power or less. Seems like any other form, so no real disadvantage to use in the change state. But I would have loved to have seen 100% heal Goku using the change state in actual close combat. The change state is a game changer. With a 4.5 quadrillion multiplier at the very least, from that to potentially limitless, combine that with a broken dragon fist that is calculated to be a further one quadrillion multiplier, or could even be limitless in attack power overall. We've got the ultimate form with limitless durability combined with a move with limitless attack power. The perfect combination. You've got yourself the most overpowered broken character in Dragon Ball history. That's why I love to call him Limitless Goku. One hundred year time skip Goku, or what you will be referring to him as after this video, Dragon God Goku. We've come a long way, but now we are finally here, and I want to give you all of the information that may make End of GT Goku a 5D character in terms of power and abilities. That is something we will determine by the end of this video, so do watch the whole video to understand why I've made certain decisions about his power using the information. He may indeed have the power to blink and wipe away the competition, so without any 
further delay, let's analyze the potential power of Dragon God Goku and complete our Dragon Ball GT Power Scale series with the largest level of power. We see him in the final half of Dragon Ball GT Episode 64 and for a couple of minutes during the GT special ending. Now, Goku was able to inform everybody, Vegeta, Piccolo, Roshi, about his new godly presence without even speaking or just through a handshake. Goku, are you? They knew and the narration was informing us he was something else entirely, not just your average Earth's Guardian or Supreme Kai. They've been watered down through the series. Goku's entire being had converted to the highest level in Dragon Ball, or in GT's continuity. So let's quickly walk through Goku's power in GT. All of these jumps are from Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu in terms of Dragon Ball raw power increase. <laughs> During the 28th Budokai Tenkaichi, Goku said they may not even win the tournament. Base Goku would fight against an angry Oob, and even though he was untrained, Oob was everything Goku expected him to be in terms of power, and be in the reincarnation of Boo. Oob's raw power is relevant to Kid Boo. If Goku grew 400 times in 10 years of peace by training alone or training with others far less powerful than himself, it's reasonable to suggest Goku grew around 200 times in 5 years after End of Z when training with a being stronger than Boo. During the Black Star Saga, Goku encounters Lord Lude. Goku and Trunks both went Super Saiyan and were still overwhelmed by level 3 Lord Lude. Months pass after Lord Lude and Goku encounters the Sigma Force where he states it has been a while since he fought someone as awesome as him and destroys them in base form. Goku encounters Baby for the first time, and it's stated Baby already absorbed the power of Lord Lude whilst in containment. Baby is a parasite, and is stated to absorb the power of the vessel he is in, and then add it to his own power. This is what a parasite does, it feeds, and it was stated General Rildo's power was then absorbed. More months pass and Baby arrives on Earth only to be confronted by Goten. Goten's base form is a match for Baby, but Baby lures him into becoming Super Saiyan as it's easier to take over a body that's powering up. Before jumping to a new host, Baby absorbs the power of the vessel he is in, which in this case, Goten's power is added to the parasite power before taking over Gohan. Goten's body and all vessels the baby leaves do not retain a baby boost. The baby boost only applies to the body that the baby parasite currently occupies. Eggs keep the rest under control and there are no stated buffs for eggs.
Weeks pass and Goku finally arrives on Earth with all Black Star Balls. Goku demonstrates a new level of base power, but Baby Vegeta also demonstrates a new level of power compared to weeks ago. Baby Super Saiyan Vegeta then absorbs the power of Gohan, Goten, Trunks and Buller. After absorbing this power in a ritual, he becomes Super Baby and Super Baby 2. In guides, this is stated to be Vegeta's Super Saiyan 2 and theoretical Super Saiyan 3 transformations. Some time passes, and the parasite baby inside of Vegeta's body would continue to feed off Vegeta's new level of power. We can finally add Vegeta's power onto the parasite body, as the parasite continues to get stronger. Official Dialogue After Goku regains his tail, it's stated he did not gain any more power whilst as a Super Saiyan 3 against Baby. But after becoming a Golden Uzaru, he could tank Baby and push him back with ease. Baby becomes a Golden Uzaru as well. He is fueled by 1,000 times more Brutes waves than what is needed for a normal Golden Uzaru. It's stated Baby is unnaturally overloaded. Brutes waves grant power, as shown when they refuel Baby's power. Fighters can stack power onto their own. Therefore, it's Golden Uzaru times a thousand. Special attacks raise the user's power by different multipliers. The Gallic Gun is shown to be times 3, the Kamehameha is 2.2 times, the 10 times Kamehameha is 22 times, and Baby's Super Gallic Gun rivaled that in battle. Goku becomes full power Super Saiyan 4. The Saiyans only replenish his lost key, but Goku gets stronger. He absorbs Baby's final attack. In guides, it's stated you can negate attacks by emitting two times the power. Baby spammed Super Gallic Guns, but they all failed, meaning the final Revenge Death Ball is at least a 22 times multiplier.
Months pass until the Super 17 arc. Majub attacks Super 17 from behind. Super 17 is left open, but does not even flinch, which puts his start in power at least two times Majub. Goku soon arrives and becomes Super Saiyan 1. He punches Super 17 across the planet, but still struggles with his power. Super Android 17 absorbs the full power of Goku's 10 times Kamehameha, and it's stated the power of that attack is added onto his own level of power. Majub constantly attacked an open Super 17 from behind, which did no damage. When Super 17 is absorbing Android 18's energy blasts, he is open once again. Just because 17 is open, Goku's attack must still rival Super 17 to penetrate his body, because Majub's failed. Goku is weakened and can't lift a finger. Soon after the Super 17 arc, the Shadow Dragons arc begins. Haze, Natron, Ice and Oceanus are irrelevant for scaling, but Raid Shenron is critical. He defeats Super Saiyan 4 Goku and even tanks his 10 times Kamehameha. Rage only lost because the rain caused him to overload. When Goku encounters Nova Shenron, he states that Nova is far stronger than the previously defeated dragons. This includes Rage Shenron. Goku doesn't know Nova can transform at the point he first gauges his power. However, Goku in his base form can put up a decent fight against Nova. Sin Shenron arrives. Goku launches a point blank full power 10 times Kamehameha and Sin doesn't even flinch from it. Sin is at least twice the power of that attack. Goku then takes the Saiyan's power and adds it to his base. He then becomes ultra full power Saiyan 4. This level of power heavily dominates Sin Shenron, not tank, but heavily dominate, which would be around 1.75 times Sin Shenron. But then Sin becomes Omega and is stated to be more than 10 times stronger than before. Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta is formed, a consistent fusion multiplier that works well in conjunction with multiple source materials from Dragon Ball is by adding the strongest forms of two characters together, then multiply that by 100. Max A plus Max B, then times 100, equals base fusion. The multiplier of Omega Shenron's minus energy ball is unknown, but it is his strongest attack where it took the power of Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta to deflect it. The negative energy ball is stated to be similar in concept to Baby's Revenge Death Ball, and opposite of Spirit Bomb energy. A 22 times multiplier is reasonable.
During the spirit bomb, a weakened Goku undergoes a change. He gains a white aura and appears invincible, tanking Omega Shenron's minus energy ball without flinching, making him twice as strong, at least. This is Goku's change state that makes him the god of Dragon Ball, the strongest Goku of all. One hundred years later, Goku is seen once again and it's stated he continued training with Shenlong for one hundred years. We can apply two different growth multipliers to calculate one hundred years time skip Goku. If he grew four hundred times in ten years, then four thousand times. Or we can apply his growth during the 1.5 years during the events of Dragon Ball GT, dividing his end of GT base form by his start of GT base form and work it out for 100 years. And that's how strong Goku gets in Dragon Ball GT. The Dragon Realm is the most mysterious part of Dragon Ball lore, but the one area that has very, very little on it in terms of lore. There is information from official source material that helps connect some dots. But let's look at the Heroes manga for a second, which came out before Dragon Ball Super, but it's an entirely different continuity than GT, and non-canon to the ZGT-verse, but it's still official material. The Dragon Realm, or Shadow Dragon Realm, is shown in the Dragon Ball Heroes Victory Mission manga made by Toyotaro. It's the nest in where the shadow dragons live. We can't really use anything from this because it's lore within the heroes video game world, but one thing that is quite hilarious is that the shadow dragons within that game were able to escape and affect the universe of the living world. What does that make the shadow dragons in terms of power? Well, they are GT characters after all, but I'll leave that one up to you. There was also this wiki page about the Dragon Realm, about it not possessing any known laws of physics present in the 12 universes, and no deities have access to it. Unfortunately, this is a fan wiki, and we cannot use that either. But that would have solidified Goku's 5D after leaving with Shenron, because if he lived in a place that others cannot get to or exist there, due to it having no known laws of the universe present, that would be insane. But we have to be fair here. We cannot use that. There is no proof that Shenron took Goku to that dimension exactly. It's not stated in the actual show, but you can piece the source material, lore, and story together yourself to work out that he did. Goku became one with Shenron, which is backed up by the fact we see Goku merge with Shenron and the Dragon Balls, and by the fact Goku granted Goku Jr.'s wish that saved Pan and Puck, who magically appeared together the moment Goku vanished. Very mysterious, isn't it? It just goes to show that Goku's wish potential is far greater than regular Shenron due to having only one Dragon Ball and not needing to abide by the rules altogether. I mean, just how strong is he in the magical sense, which could be used in combat if needed? Now, in an official interview in the Dragon Ball GT DVD box, Dragon Box GT Dragon Book, out of the scripts for all 64 episodes of GT, Atsushi Mikawa wrote the most, with a total of 28 episodes plus the TV special, and he says, and then after that, after he defeats Yi Zinglong and grants the final wish, Goku goes right off with Shenlong and the Dragon Balls to somewhere that people definitely can't get to. Now, in an official Dragon Ball GT interview in the GT Perfect Files with Goku's Japanese voice actress, it states the scene where after Goku finishes fighting, he rides on Shenlong and says, Shenlong's back sure is warm. That's because riding on Shenlong means that Goku's going to leave this world and go to the world of the gods. I was glad they didn't write it plainly that he died, though. I feel that Goku probably went to Shenlong's place and is training again. 
She even says there, I was glad they didn't write it plainly that he died. She's obviously met and discussed the material with the writer, so has more of an understanding than we all do about the behind the scenes part. That's what I heavily presume. The fact that she of all people said Goku probably went to Shenlong's place in his training again should be extremely reassuring of what happened to Goku and what the behind the scenes really intended for Goku probably means a good chance of. And at the bottom of that interview it states, I believe that Goku is now training at God's place so someday for sure he'll become an even more wonderful Goku and come back before us, I'm sure of it. So. We have Shenlong's place, God's place, world of the gods, and also a place where people definitely cannot get to. So that cancels out the lookout if you thought she was referring to God's place, because that is not exactly Shenlong's place either. And it's not the world of the gods because people can definitely get there. Next, it's not anywhere in the universe. People can get to most places. Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, Kid Buu have multiple times have been to different dimensions in the universe, even when they are alive. And not one of the dimensions that we typically see such as Heaven, Supreme Kai's world, none of those are Shenlong's place or world of the gods that she meant because Goku could go wherever he wanted. Hell, even Hercule was in the Supreme Kai's world. The human's energy for the spirit bomb actually got to the Supreme Kai's world. Goku had gone to a plane inaccessible to others and could apparently go there once he ascended and joined the dragon. The realm beyond the Kais is Shenlong's place, or we can say the dragon realm, so it's reasonable to say Goku went to Shenlong's home there. That's enough reassurance on its own when linking it to Dragon Ball lore. Because if you deny that, then you have to provide a counter of where he did go, and what can people say? Uh, he, well... <laughs> He went to Vermilion City? Sorry pal, there's more source material and evidence pointed towards the Dragon Realm or Shenlong's home than any other location. It's true we don't know where it is, but we know where it's not, and it's not anywhere in the universe, based on official interviews and source material, and even the concept art of the universe by Akira Toriyama. The Dragon Realm is not there. So it's either outside of that universe model by a long shot, it's either invisible or inaccessible due to it being something else entirely, which could very well mean it does not possess any physics that are present in the actual universe, hence why it's just not there. Then that can potentially mean Goku is 5D for being able to live in his regular 4D universe, but also being able to exist somewhere else where nothing else in the 4D universe can be at. And on top of all that, He's actually been training for 100 years, which makes his potential reach levels we cannot even begin to imagine. Who knows how efficient his power could grow once merging with the Dragon Balls. Some guides, the Daisenshu Super Exciting Guide and a board game guide, say the other world is 5D. I think Takeo Kayama even mentioned 5D, or maybe he even said 6D. But you have to remember, he fully admitted he doesn't power scale. He doesn't like versus battles or anything like that. He just enjoys writing. And that is a guy who literally said Broly Solo is the Z-verse. So take that with a pinch of salt. But even if you did want to go with the other world being 5D from the other sources, thus making many characters in Dragon Ball reach that level, that also makes the location where Goku went potentially a 6D realm, depending on which source you think is the most reliable. Personally, I think it's a bit extreme going 6D. I think it's reasonable to say that the universe and everything in the model is 4D, but the Dragon Realm is beyond that, a higher level dimension. That makes the most sense. So why is GT Goku have to leave him with Shenlong 5D? It's because he has the power ability and authority to travel through, access and live in the Shenlong world that no other being in the entire universe structure can get to, not even the highest level of Kai or gods in the hierarchy of Z to GT's continuity. And to top it all off, even if you want to put him against another being of 5D power, Goku is 100 years ahead in terms of experience with that power he had when he left with Shenlong. Is Goku truly omnipotent? Close to or not at all? Let's look at what he's actually done and what he can be compared to in Dragon Ball GT. Firstly, let's discuss the Black Star Dragon Balls and the regular Dragon Balls. From the lore of Dragon Ball itself, the power of a dragon fully depends on the power of a guardian. You cannot simply ask a Shenlong to kill a villain if the villain's power surpasses the dragon and the power of the wish surpasses the guardian's potential. It's that simple. With Granola in Dragon Ball Super, there was a sacrifice. That's a little bit different. Now, Kami and Dende have pitiful levels of power, but managed to create Shenlong that can grant almost anything. Keyword, almost. 
with restrictions in some cases too. The same with the Namekian Dragon Balls. The power of those dragons correlates with the strength of the Guardian. Now this is why the Black Star Dragon Balls are a very special case because the Guardian actually was the nameless Namekian. So let's just say Piccolo for ease because Piccolo was linked to them in GT. The reason why the Black Star Dragon Balls have unlimited power, yes, literally stated to be limitless and can grant anything, is due to the Guardian being insanely stronger in raw power than just a regular Guardian like Dende and Kami. Piccolo's power in general, even as the nameless Namekian, was dimensions above Dende and Kami. So it's no surprise the dragon that spawned from the nameless Namekian's power is the dog's bollocks and reached the omnipotent level in the 4D universe because the wishes have unlimited potential. What does this have to do with End of GT Goku? Well, it's simple, isn't it? If the nameless Namekian's power to create a dragon was what it took to reach 4D Limitless, then what do you think the Dragon Balls and Shenlong once merging with Goku's power at the end of GT would be capable of? Goku plus Dragon Balls plus Shenlong cannot be anything less than Piccolo plus Dragon Balls plus Shenlong. It's that simple. Because Goku is literally seen merging with Shenlong and the Dragon Balls, that power initially in the dragon created by Dende has now combined with Goku's power, which ultimately enhances both Shenlong and the Dragon Balls and Goku because they've all merged like a type of fusion. Furthermore, as shown in the GT special with Pan and Puck, there's extra support of Goku's wishing potential without having the need for all seven Dragon Balls. This guy just goes freestyle. Using the Black Star Dragon Balls against Dragon God Goku and the other way around should not have any effect because both are unlimited and can cancel each other out in terms of their own power. It would make absolutely no sense for the Nameless Namekian's creation to overpower Dragon God Goku 100 years after GT. If the Black Star Dragon Balls power are on omnipotent to the 4D universe, limitless power, then Goku's new power would not be nigh omnipotent or anything less than omnipotent in this case by using the lore of the Dragon Balls. He's not omnipotent in general, just to the 4D universe, where he could completely warp the reality of the 4D verse. Imagine where he'd be 100 years later. Now I want to talk about End of GT Goku's ability to appear in different realms, particularly after Omega Shenron. Goku appeared instantly in Hell and shook Piccolo's hand saying goodbye. Now what I'll be talking about here doesn't prove 4D omnipotence, but it does prove Goku can pass through dimensions as he pleases with the hack of ascending to his change state. Dimensional skipping if you will. Now initially I bet you'll find this pointless and believe Goku can teleport anywhere in the universe, including heaven or hell, if he can easily teleport to the Supreme Kai's world, which is further away, and Kid Buu can also appear in the other world in the anime. What's the big deal? Well, let me tell you. It's proven in Dragon Ball Goku cannot use instant transmission to heaven or hell, as we never see him teleport to those particular realms. And why is this? He can do this with the Supreme Kai's world or King Kai's planet, but why do we never see him teleport straight to hell or heaven, except through the use of an assistant guide like Baba or the taxi driver? You see, heaven and hell are much different in terms of dimensionality. Either way, in GT, teleporting to heaven or hell wasn't possible, as proven where Goku, despite relearning instant transmission at the end of the baby saga, thanks to Piccolo, and could also use it as Super Saiyan 4 if he wanted to, he still couldn't escape hell in the Super 17 saga by locking onto energy and just saving a load of time. The only person who could have got Goku out of hell was King Yama, but due to the minus energy starting to mess with the worlds, plot had it so Yama couldn't help Goku with his power. Only Piccolo could help Goku using the portal plot. Furthermore, Cell in Dragon Ball GT knows instant transmission and is also incapable of escaping hell. This is a being, a villain, who would escape hell in an instant if he could. But the fact he's still in hell means he cannot use instant transmission to escape. So that also supports the unique dimensionality of hell. Even if you want to argue heaven, Goku can get into heaven. It doesn't matter. Hell is the only example we truly need here because... Goku, after ascending at the end of GT, could pop in and out of hell without authority, without instant transmission. GT Goku could do it because he's broken. It was a hack. 
Goku had the ability to open dimensional rifts at will, moving in and out of reality as he pleases. If Otherworld is 5D, using some official source material, then Goku is 5D as he can cross the dimensional barrier to reach there. But either way, Goku has the ability to teleport through uncrossable dimensional barriers. This is either a 5D feat or a hax. And this is before the Shenron merger, which granted him further magical hacks and powers. Even if you don't want to consider this important, it would still be a deciding move in versus battles because GT Goku could literally teleport your ass into hell and you couldn't escape that dimensionality with instant transmission. The only way you could do it is to bend over with your balls in a knot for Big Green and say, oh sweet Kami, open the portal. In conclusion, if you don't want to accept that Goku is 5D from the Shenlong realm research and statements in the official material, that's absolutely fine. It's mysterious and vague and it's completely understandable if someone doesn't find it strong enough of an argument. However, the further information on Goku's feet in Sugoroku's space is far stronger in terms of reliability due to it being official dialogue, statements and visual representation from the actual Dragon Ball GT show itself. And by researching the history of the concept of Sugoroku space through the writer's choice, you have at your disposal 100% official, reliable, and usable evidence to explain that base GT Goku is 5D in the Baby Saga. Every character in GT around that level of power or stronger, you can reasonably conclude they have the same 5D power from a power standpoint. Just because everyone doesn't always show it doesn't mean they cannot do it. How many shockwaves did you see after Goku vs Beerus and Super? I'll leave it at that because plot takes over. But then if you really want to go out your way to dismiss these two credible foundations of analysis, there's also the Omega Shenron feat combining with the hyperspace destruction that makes fighters at that moment 5D. Either way you want to slice the cake, the three explanations and analysis all point to Chain State Goku being 5D. We can't simply cap the Chain State's power or Goku's raw power at the end of GT it's actually infinite on a 4D scale. And there's the bonus explanation of Change Goku Cross in any dimension he wishes, which may be a 5D feat if you consider heaven and hell being higher level dimensionality than the rest of the universe. And of course, the 4D omnipotence due to being logically above the Black Star Dragon Ball's power. Thank you all so much for watching this through. Thumbs up the video if you get a chance to, as I hope you learned something about GT that helped reveal just what has been ignored or downplayed over the years. This is the power of 100 years time skip Dragon God Goku, or even Baby Saga Base Goku. And I'm done. Until we meet again.